Los Angeles City Council. Mr. Mejia, can we begin our proceedings by calling the roll? Sir, uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. Present. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee. Present. Uh, Ms. Jaroslawski. Here. Ms. Padilla. Present. And Ms. Hutt. Here. Five members and a quorum, Mr. Chair. All right, we'll start this meeting by taking public comment on agenda items. Our goal is to get to as many speakers as possible. We'll then move through the agenda one item at a time, listen to staff presentations, and vote on the items accordingly. City Clerk, can you please read the rules of public comment into the record? Appellants and or their representatives and applicants and or their representatives will be allowed to speak for a total of three minutes per site unless otherwise noted by the chair. Members of the public wishing to speak on one agenda item only shall have an opportunity to speak for one minute. Appellants and applicants will be given an opportunity to speak when their item is called. Each appellant and applicant has a total of three minutes to speak. An appellant can choose to have a single representative speak on his or her behalf or divide the three minutes among his or her team. Anyone else, including an attorney or project manager wishing to speak on an appellant's behalf who does not do so during this three minute period may offer a minute of public comment whenever the committee chairperson opens the public comment period for the meeting, which is usually at the beginning of the meeting. Therefore, we expect that appellants and applicants have the respective teams assembled and ready to present at the appropriate times today. Members of the public wishing to speak on more than one item shall state that and shall be allowed to speak for a total of two minutes. Failure to submit public comment in a timely manner before the comment period for the item ends results in forfeiture of the opportunity to participate in public comment for the item. Mr. Chair, if I may for the record, a letter from the Studios Neighborhood Council has been submitted for item no number 11, clarifying their position against the matter unless amended, and a community impact statement has been submitted for item 11 by the Woodland Hills Warner Center Neighborhood Council against the matter unless amended. Madam City Attorney, please provide additional guidance on public comment. Corsani City Attorney's Office. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we will move on to the next speaker. We will inform you when your time is up. All right, before we turn to public comment, I'd like to open the floor to any additional recommendations. Uh, committee members or city planning department staff may have regarding the items that will become before us today planning department has none thank you all right none from planning department members of the committee members of the council i'd like to um, ask to speak on items 15 and 16 please okay Any other amendments? Now is the time for amendments. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Elizabeth Enne, and I'm the Planning and Economic Development Director for Council Member Bob Blumenfield. I'm here with my colleague, Michelle Majid, to comment on the Ventura Cuenca specific plan amendment, sorry. Um, I wanna take this opportunity to commend and appreciate the high level of engagement from community members and city staff on so, this So item. we'll come back to you for comments. This is for okay. technical amendments. Uh, yes, there's an uh, amendment on item 11 that was presented to the city attorney and the clerk. Okay. Um, and the amendment, which should be in letter form already with the clerk is um, adding one member appointed at large by each of the council members of the districts in which the specific plan is located. So this is in addition to CPC's recommendation. Okay. Is, this, is that sufficient for us to take a vote? Yes, when the time is up, or when the time is 
um, when it's time for the committee to vote, then yes, that, can, that recommendation can be either adopted or rejected, but this is enough for public comment. We, yeah, so we, okay, good. Correct. Okay. And I believe, excuse me, Chair, do we have one from Planning Department, Melinda? I apologize, we do have one. Okay, but come on, come on down. Good afternoon, Council Members. This is Melinda Sachin with the Department of City Planning. We have um, received um, requests for amendments from the applicant for agenda item number five. Um, the letter has been submitted to the council file. It includes modifications to section 5.5 affordable housing of the specific plan. Um, the modification would be to section 5.5B to decapitalize the term affordable housing units in the second mention in the paragraph. And the other change would be to section 5.5C in the last sentence to strike the words provided pursuant to and replace it with required under section 5.5A of the specific plan. All right. All right, that's sufficient for that one. Any other amendments? Yes, sir, come on down. Um, honorable council members, um, I am here to request amendments for items 13. Tell us your name and your affiliation. My name is Rahelio Pardo. I'm the Transportation Infrastructure Deputy for CD13. Thank you. Um, I'm here to request um, amendments to items 13 and 14. We submitted a technical letter outlining those amendments um, to the council files, respectively. That's it. All right. Thank you. Madam City Attorney, is that sufficient? Yes. Uh, um, Mr. Pardo, when was it submitted to the council file? It was submitted earlier this afternoon, so about an hour and a half ago. Okay. Can you, can you summarize the um, change to the map? Sure, the um, changes are specific to the specific conditions one, two, and five that were outlined by the Bureau of Engineering um, in the letter of determination submitted by the CPC on October 31st, 2023. Um, for agenda item number 13, we're requesting for the committee to approve the staff's recommendations. For item number 14, um, we are requesting a move to grant in part and in deny in part the appeal of the deputy um, advisory agency's approval of ves vesting tentative tract 834781A with the following modifications to waive the required highway dedication and roadway widening for lot one of tract 9834 of 5601 to 5609 West Santa Monica Boulevard as submitted by our office in the letter. Is that all? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Others? Other amendments, technical or otherwise? All right. Um, seeing none, I will now move to our uh, items where there's been a request to continue. Those are items number one, number four, number five, and number 12. Item one, there's a request to continue to the 5th of March, 2024. Item four, there's a request to continue to the 19th of March, 2024. Item 12, there's a recommendation to contend, continue till March 5th, 2024. And that concludes our continuation calendar. Uh, I will call the roll, Mr. Harris right. Dawson, for those continuances, as you have stated. Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Yes. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. And those items have been continued. All right. Uh, and now the chair is uh, for public comment. For the sake of public comment, the folks should know that the chair will request that we take items 3, 7, 10, and 13. Items 3, 7, 10, and 13 on consent. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll go to public comment. I will start by calling a few names. Par pardon me before you call names. I made a mistake. The consent calendar is recommended by the chair will be items 3, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and 13. So 7 through 10, not 7 and 10. So items 3, 7, 8, 9, and 10, along with item 13. Now we'll go to public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck Powell, Doug Haynes, Nicholas Reyes, 
Amerilis Ortiz, Amy Smith, Araceli Bolanos. Please line up to your left-hand side. If you are an applicant or appellant, we ask that you wait until your item has been heard. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Doug Haynes. I'm here for items 13, 14, and also briefly general public comment. So, three minutes. You may begin. Okay, thank you. On items 13 and 14, I ask that you support the merger and also waive the dedication requirement as proposed by the applicant and support the appeal, and I'll explain why. In the late 1980s, I drove out to Los Angeles from the upper Midwest to join my friends working in the film industry. When I got here, I exited the 101 freeway, as many people do, at Santa Monica Boulevard, took one look and wanted to turn around and go back to Michigan. Since then, it's only gotten worse. In 2004, a developer came in and took out an entire city block at the Sears site to build 437 condominiums. I asked him, why would you want to build condominiums at Santa Monica Boulevard and Western, where no one wants to, to live? Why don't you build sound stages? He said he knew what he was doing, but 20 years later, we still have a decrepit bacon lot at Santa Monica Boulevard and Western. Now we have a developer that wants to come in and build sound stages that will bring thousands of union jobs and also something for my neighbor's kids to aspire to besides working at Burger King when they're 50 years old. So I ask that you enthusiastically support the efforts by this developer to do something with this decrepit lot. On general public comment, I'm happy to see that finally the city is recognizing the problems caused by graffiti vandalism downtown. But I would ask that you recognize the problems we have in Hollywood and everywhere else in the city where this is also prevalent. I would request that a condition of approval put in on all entitled projects that come before this committee and the City Planning Commission requ requiring that an independent contractor be hired by each of these developments to independently go out every day and clean up all the graffiti that they see every day throughout the construction site process. And also a bond be posted to deal with any vandalism if the project stops. And only this way will we finally rid ourselves of all the vandalism that keeps occurring in our community. You may not even be aware that building and safety will not even accept complaints about graffiti in the city of Los Angeles. And the police have taken an off-hands approach to the whole thing. So there's nothing in, to prevent people from just going out and vandalizing our community day and night. And I ask that finally we put a stop to this by making some effort for enforcement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Nick Reyes, and I'd like to speak on item number seven. Uh, again, my name is Nick, and I'm with the uh, Western State Regional Council of Carpenters. I live in, in the local area, and I work, recreate in the vicinity of the project, and I believe that I will be impacted by the environmental, environmental impacts of the project. Uh, the city should require the project to be built with contractors that would hire locally, pay prevailing wage, and utilize apprentices from a state accredited apprenticeship training program. Uh, this, again, uh, workforce requirements reduce construction related environmental impacts while benefiting the local economy and workforce development. In a recent study, uh, 2020, uh, titled Putting California on the High Road a Jobs and Climate Action Plan for 2030. California Workforce Development Board conduct. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilman. My name is uh, Chuck Powell. I'm a 37-year union carpenter. I was uh, born and raised here in the Valley, born at uh, the hospital right here. Um, I'm here to speak against number seven. Um, it, it's, it's, it just seems to me it, it's, it's extremely unfair that these developers, they come in and take advantage of us. And it, it's time that 
you know, that you, you guys put your foot down and start demanding that uh, prevailing wage, local hire, um, state accredited programs for our apprenticeship. Uh, also, I have two sons that are in the trade, and I would like to see them uh, make it through with, uh, without missing opportunities for dance recitals, baseball games, soccer games for their kids because we have to drive so far away to to find that uh, job that that pays properly so again uh, as a western regional council member i like to oppose this project uh, number thank seven thank you speaker before the next speaker begins i will call a few more names imelda ochoa hope baines gus torres enrique gaspar Alyssa Gaines, Eleanor Collins, Elaine Loring. Please line up to your left-hand side. If you are an applicant or appellant, we ask that you wait until your item is being heard. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Amy Smith and I'm here on behalf of Creed LA. And we are here to support the Echelon Studios project, items 13 and 14. And we ask for your support as well. We support development projects like this one that have major benefits to our local economy and to our local community itself. Additionally, we support the appeal brought forth by our applicant. The scope of this project will require such a waiver be made and to make this, feasible, this project feasible. The vast, vast benefits to the area and all that this project is going to bring to our community as a whole will make this development one that is worthy of both your attention and our community's praise. Please support Hollywood, please support the community, and vote yes for this. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Araceli Bolaños. Soy parte de Community Coalition. On behalf of the community. Uh, Puede alzar su voz un poquito. No se alcanzó a escuchar lo que estaba diciendo, señora. Okay. Mi nombre es Araceli Bolaños. My no, name is Araceli Bolaños. Voy a hablar sobre el asunto número dos. And I want to talk about point number two. Y soy parte de Community Coalition. And I'm part of Community Coalition. Eh, el problema que tenemos nosotros y es de lo que voy a hablar es sobre los moteles que hay en la Figueroa. And uh, my problem is the hotels, los hoteles. Sí, el in problema. Figueroa. Sí, mucho problema porque nosotros llevamos los niños a la escuela, pasamos por ahí y los niños miran ese desorden que hay y es un problema muy grande. Lo que uh, queremos es que cierren el, el motel Boulevard, que es el de mayor problema. Okay. Uh, so we take our kids to uh, school and uh, our kids are seeing all the thing, things that are happening there at, um, on those hotels in Figueroa and what we are asking is that you guys uh, shut the... Uh, Boulevard Motel because that's where most of the issues are occurring. Sí, sería bueno, pues nosotros estamos luchando por eso y primero Dios, pues con la ayuda de ustedes y, y nosotros, las madres de familia, los profesores y los alumnos, creo que sí lo podemos lograr. And I would like uh, your support because uh, we're fighting for this as uh, parents, as teachers, as members of the community, and I think with your support we could do it. Sí, este, les estoy agradecida por eso y esperamos seguir apoyando y que ustedes también nos apoyen para poder lograr todo ese problema que tenemos en la Figueroa y la 81. Um, and so we're very grateful and we're hoping that with your support we can tackle the problem that we're having in Figueroa en 81. Sí, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. Mi nombre es Amarili Ortiz. My name, my name is Amarili Ortiz. Estoy a favor de esto. And I'm in favor of that. De este proyecto y les pido que ustedes también lo hagan. And I'm asking for you to be in favor of it as well. Este proyecto se está construyendo en el sitio abandonado de la antigua tienda Sears. Uh, this project is being built in what used to be the Sears building. Que durante mucho tiempo ha sido un gran problema. And it's been a problem for dolor, a Y ha sido un dolor de cabeza para el área. And it's been a problem for a very long time and it's been a headache for the area. 
Este será uno de los primeros estudios de Hollywood construidos expresamente en Los Ángeles. Uh, this would be one of the first Hollywood studios built express, uh, solely in Los Angeles. En más de 20 años. In more than 20 years. Creo que es una señal importante de la recuperación de la ciudad. I believe it's an important sign of the recovery of the city. Porque por muchos años anteriores ha sido pérdidas financieras en general. Because uh, it's been for many years just general losses financially. Reval re revitalicemos Hollywood con este proyecto. Vote así y sigamos luchando como mujeres que vivimos dentro del área, esa es nuestra preocupación. Um, and it would help revitalize Hollywood, so let's support Hollywood, let's vote yes, as women who uh, keep fighting for that area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Hello, um, my name is Hope, first name is Hope, my last name is Baines, and I'm here speaking on item two, this is in regards to the uh, Boulevard Hotel that's located at um, 6919 and 6923 on South Figueroa. This is a hotel that uh, I have personally observed that prostitution is going on there. Um, I have seen this happen. I have personally seen, um, have spoken with a individual that was transporting narcotics up and down Figueroa, and um, I have seen the pimps, I have seen the prostitutes, and they do not dress very appropriately for what, you know, they're out there, G-strings, whatever. We have a school that's along around two, two blocks away from this particular area, and children are there, and they observe this. Parents cannot take their children down the street. This is going on, and I personally have witnesses. And so I am here asking you for all the motels, motels, hotels, the boulevard, and all the rest of them that's located on this corridor to be stopped. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, public speaking and item number two. My name is Enrique Gaspar, and I'm an organizer with Community Coalition. Working the last 10 years with the residents of South LA, it's impossible not to notice the problem that nuisance motels cause all over the areas I work, particularly the Figueroa Corridor from Century Boulevard to Slauson Avenue. Those motels have contributed to an extensive cycle of exploitation, violence, and crime in the area. Talking quotidianly with people living across the Figueroa Corridor, I have heard all kinds of stories that families have to go through every day, like this seven-year-old boy living right in front of the Boulevard Motel that now knows what to do inside his apartment in case of a shooting outside. He should not be worried about violence and crime. He should be having a peaceful time at home or in a park close to his apartment. That is not possible now. The violence outside his apartment is part of all activities happening at any time of day and night at the Boulevard Motel. We're here to ask this committee to cancel definitively the license to operate to this nuisance motel so residents in the area have a peaceful life that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Imelda Ochoa. My name is Adriana Ochoa. Imelda. Imeta. Tengo muchos años viviendo en el sur centro alrededor de Figueroa. I've uh, been living for many years in South Central around Figueroa. Muy cerca del Boulevard Motel y particularmente quiero o necesito que cierren el motel. Particularly around the Boulevard Motel and I ask, no, I need for that motel to be closed. Porque estando operando el lugar se mira de todo, robos, drogadicción y no se diga la prostitución. Because there you see everything drug addiction, robbery, and not to mention prostitution. Y eso es muy desagradable para nosotros que vivimos ahí en el área. And that's quite unpleasant for those of us who live there in the area. Ahora imagínense ustedes que tenemos que caminar con nuestros hijos, nietos, o tal vez vecinitos a la escuela. Now imagine those of us who have to walk with our children, our grandchildren, or maybe younger neighbors to school. Y que miren todo lo que pasa ahí and them seeing everything that happens there. 
Yo personalmente invito a los dueños de los moteles que vengan a vivir al área, que vengan a caminar a sus hijos a la escuela aquí y que vengan a vivir ahí. I am personally inviting the owners of the hotel to come there, to walk their children to school, to go live in the area, and personally to go there and see what it's like. Y que no solo vengan a vivir del negocio que hacen ahí, que vengan a caminar en el área, no solamente hacer negocio con nuestra comunidad. And I'm not comunidad. asking them to simply do business, I'm asking them to come there and see what it's like to live there. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Before the next speaker begins, I will call a few more names. Richard Shave, Robert Collins, Sarah Avellan, Sheila Smith, Zach Strasters, Kathy Del Don. <coughs> speaker, you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Eleanor Collins, and I am a resident of South Central LA. I am also a member of Community Coalition. In our community, we deal with poverty, violence, and lack. These are issues that we deal with. The motels in our community, specifically the Boulevard Motel, brings disgrace, negativity, and exploitation to our community. These motels are not building up our community. They are tearing it down. The motel owners and operators need to be held accountable for their unethical behavior. We should not have to leave our community to get the things that we need. We need these places to be shut down so that we can have homes, senior centers, green spaces, child cares, libraries, and I urge you to stand with us to free the land. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Good afternoon, I'm speaking on item 14. My name is Gus Torres, and I'm a proud member of UA Local 250 pipe fitters, welders, and apprentices. I'm speaking on behalf of our 6,600 members today in support of this project. I cannot stress enough what the developer has done with this project, working from the beginning to ensure this project is done right. Our skilled members of Local 250 will always stand behind projects like this one and we ask that you do too. So please vote yes today. Thank you for your time and God bless. Thank you, speaker. I'm speaking on four and five. I'm Elaine Loring. I'm here on behalf of NoHo Home Alliance, One LA, and representing concerns of the neighborhood council and the community. First, we ask the chairman of this committee and the city attorney and the council president how a 16-acre billion dollar project on our public land was allowed to bypass Plum and sent directly to council in December. Um, the city housing element talks of equitable communities and the need for 40% of new housing to be affordable. District NoHo, with just 20% mostly segregated affordable housing, is an enormous missed opportunity to further the housing element intentions and targets. Plum should be a watchdog. We ask, how do you envision achieving these RENA targets when public land is used in this way? Thank you for including the 55 additional income restricted homes in the development agreement. However, three Thank you, Speaker, that's your time. And I just want to flag that four and five was continued to March. Four was continued to March. Four was continued, but not five. How you doing? My name is Robert. I'm speaking on items two and general comments. I'm going to work with Community Coalition. I'm speaking on the Boulevard Motel. The Boulevard Motel, first of all, is not a tourist motel. Those motels do not serve, that motel and any other motel in Figueroa, do not serve the community in the positive way of all. We have kids that cannot even walk the street without seeing what's going on. And what's going on is that these motels, specifically the Boulevard Motel, are fostering everything. 
everything that goes on is around these motels. We need to turn these motels into something that the community can enjoy and be proud about. Right now, they can be proud about anything if they can't even walk the street to walk to the store and seeing what the motels allow to happen in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Sheila Smith, and I am coming to you on behalf of item number two, the motels on 69th and Figueroa. I am a second generation homeowner with two properties near um, the Figueroa corridor. And I just think it's absolutely deplorable that children, parents are unable to walk the streets for a stroll without having their children being exposed to prostitution, drugs, violence. It's just awful. You know, um, it's been going on for too long, and please, whatever you do, please, please, please um, shut these motels down and stop robbing these children of a childhood. They're being exposed to things they shouldn't be seeing at this time in their lives. So I beseech you to please do not allow this motel to be reestablished. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hi, good afternoon, guys. Zach with Creed. Good to see you. Uh, speaking of, um, against the appeal on 14, uh, we're in favor of the uh, Planning Commission's support of the project, uh, the Deputy Advisory Agency's determination. Um, you know, this is 510 plus thousand square feet of uh, production studio, creative office space, and over 12,000 square feet of restaurant space. So. It's a no-brainer. It's a slam dunk. We want to support our local economy. We want to support Echelon. The community wants it. So we recognize that this one doesn't take too much consideration. Deny the appeal. Support the project. Thank you so much for your time, and God bless you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Kathy Deladani. I'm president of the Plan Review Board for the Ventura Coenga Boulevard Corridor Specific Plan. Uh, eight months ago, the uh, board was shocked when we learned that the city planning department was recommending only one rep uh, for each of the six communities along uh, the 17 miles of Ventura Boulevard. In August, last August, the board passed a motion asking that two reps be appointed uh, for each community, one by the council member of, and one by the neighborhood council, in addition to having a mayor's appoint, appoint, uh, appointment, uh, uh, an appointment by the mayor. Uh, thereby, the board would consist of 13 members, easily a manageable number, uh, in addition to giving the community a better knowledge of the community and what is needed for that community. We're not spooked by the number 13, but I guess the planning department may be. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Before the next speaker begins, I will call a few more names. Brian Germain, J. Sue Burks, Joseph May, Lance, Latanya Davis, Letitia Luna, Marco Yanez. Speaker, you may begin. Good afternoon, my name is Sarah Avian, and I'm actually here to speak on two parts, part two and part 13. Uh, part 13 in reference to how there's a lot of potential in Los Angeles um, in regards to, uh, you know, uh, studio industries um, and coming and bringing uh, jobs for some of the veterans that are already involved versus also some of those who want to be become a part of the industry and providing entry-level opportunities. Uh, in regards to part 13, I see that there's already established um, businesses or agencies or organizations that are bringing a little bit of um, co conflicting challenges already within our established uh, community and they're giving uh, Los Angeles kind of a bad rep, a bad name, let me just say it makes a statement if uh, the motels um, and the businesses that are going on in Figueroa have already made it on the news. I believe it's already escalated to where it just needs attention. So I am for and I implore you to support um, Project 13 and 
to go against and revoke the license for the motels and have it shut down. Thank you so much. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, hello, Commission. Uh, I, Richard Shea, private citizen. Uh, I'm here to speak on agenda item three. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that you've been reading my mail uh, and that, that there has been an action taken, but I think you needed to read a little more carefully. I wanted this tabled so this agreement, this uh, closed door sealed agreement about the land use decisions regarding the 1923 B'nai B'rith Community Center at 9th and Union be made in a public forum. And since you're gonna pass it on consent, which means there'll be no discussion, I am just gonna let everyone know that we'll see you at full council to again ask this settlement, which Deputy City Attorney Lucy Atwood is putting together with Catholic Charities, a tangentially connected nonprofit to the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, be put to the public so we can understand what this land use decision about this culturally significant monument to the Jewish, African American, and the labor movement is and we can give comments so thanks so we'll see you at full council and looking forward to seeing what this is before it goes back to superior court thank you speaker hello my name is latonya davis and i'm from the community coalition the boulevard motels and all the motels it's a disgrace to our community. It's not building it up. And it's like the old saying, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And if this doesn't serve our community, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hello, I'm Joseph Cohen May from the Los Angeles Housing Production Institute. Um, I want to speak on item 16, um, which is a uh, appeal of the CEQA determination and the density bonus on a housing project on Kelton. Um, this project is clearly ap uh, applicable for the categorical CEQA exemption and claims that there are, are inadequate um, infrastructure incorrect and the standard um, development standards, such as the low impact development um, standards for controlling flooding, um, that will handle what um, those concerns were. Um, this project also is a great example of a density bonus project and why the state has the density bonus in the first place, and it will bring um, 11 affordable units to the community. Um, so I highly encourage you to deny the appeal and approve the project. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Leticia. Soy miembro de Community Collection. This is interpreter speaking. Can you get closer to the microphone? Puede acercarse al micrófono, por favor. A ver ahora. Si puede volver a comenzar. Gracias. Okay. Soy miembro de Collection de Community Collection. Este administrador zona sobre el impacto de los moteles. Mi nombre es Leticia. Yo vivo cerca del motel Boulevard. My y name is Leticia. I belong to the community, uh, part of the administration, and this is regarding the motels. Y paso siempre por la calle Figueroa y yo veo muchas muchachas encueradas a estos moteles están cerca de las escuelas e iglesias. This is interpreter speaking. I need to clarify. Yo veo muchas, señora, no puede escuchar, disculpe. Uh, yo vivo cerca de los mo del motel Boulevard y paso siempre por la calle de Figueroa y veo a muchas muchachas encueradas. Estos moteles están cerca de las escuelas e iglesias. I live close to um, Motel Boulevard. I walk through Figueroa and I see lots of changuereadas, um, but it's close to schools and churches. No es posible que los estudiantes que son niños vean esto cada vez que van a las escuelas y cuando salen de las escuelas. Y yo soy una it persona. It is not possible for students who go to schools to see all this when they go into the school and then when, when they leave the school. 
y yo soy una persona mayor, me siento mal al verlos así en un mal ejemplo para los niños. And I'm an older person, I feel bad seeing them like that. That's a bad example for the kids. Para todas las personas que queremos que por favor cierren este motel Boulevard. For everyone, we want please to close this uh, Boulevard Motel. Para que todos los niños estén libres de ver todo eso, lo que pasa ahí en, el, en los moteles. So the kids won't see all that that is happening in the, mo the motel. Gracias. Que Dios los bendiga. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, speaker. Before the next speaker begins, I will call a few more names. Lisa Sarkin, Reverend Dylan Littlefield, Marie Suli, Nella Cook, Reed Hutchison, Sheila Smith. Good afternoon. My name is Marco Yanez. I'm speaking on behalf of Agenda 13 and 14. My, uh, I'm, a rep I'm a member of the Western States Regional Council of Carpenters. I live, work, and recreate in the vicinity of the project. The developer has committed to work with contractors that will hire local, locally and utilize apprentices from a state, a state certified apprenticeship uh, training program. I would like to express my support for the project as I believe it will benefit the environment and the local economy by practicing protocol that will protect workers' health, safety, and incorporate adequate environmental mitigations. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Brian Germain. I am a representative on behalf of Sheet Metal Workers Local 105 here in Los Angeles. We support the project laid out in item 14 and we ask for your support votes as well. People like us, the local skilled and trained workforce members are advocating for shared prosperity in the pursuit of a better future for our families, our communities, and all of Southern California. The applicant has demonstrated their commitment to these ideas by committing to local hire. Additionally, the appeal brought forth by the applicant is both fair and sensible. We support their requested waiver in the entire project. Please also show your support by voting yes and approving this project. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I'm Father Dylan Littlefield speaking on number, item number three and public comment. Uh, I am astonished at the lengths the city is going to to hide and uh, subvert the public process. Uh, the closed door settlement agreement that the City of Los Angeles and Catholic Charities has reached um, is shocking. Uh, this building is a remarkable building, not just for its architecture, for, but the history that took place in this amazing building. Uh, not only was it the, uh, uh, an amazing place where the Jewish community gathered, not just the religious community, but the, the secular Jewish community grew and flourished here at the very beginning of this building. The architecture is amazing. The AFL took over the building, and this is where the AFL, where the labor unions were first integrated. I think it's shocking and inappropriate and sad, especially during Black History Month, that uh, we are, uh, this, this committee is uh, making this decision on the consent calendar. The, uh, the settlement agreement should be public. The settlement agreement should be open. The settlement agreement should be exposed so that all the people of the city of Los Angeles can learn what is happening to this amazing historic resource. The fact that it has gone from a potential closed session to simply a consent item is even more stunning. Uh, this is not the concept of open government that uh, our city and our, our nation relies on for everything that we do. Uh, the, the, the settlement agreement should be public. It should be made public. This building, the people of the city of Los Angeles and the Jewish community, the African American community, the labor community has a right to know exactly what is going on with this amazing and remarkable historic resource. Please uh, open up the settlement agreement, make it public, take it off the consent calendar, take it off the closed session. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Before the next speaker begins, I will call a few more names. Brenda Campos, Carlos Leon, David Goldberg, Derek Ryder, Frank Weiser, Greg Ames.
You may begin, speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Neela Cook. I'm with Anchor Church of Los Angeles. I ask this afternoon that you support items 13 and 14 with your yes votes. We do not take lightly that our members may work at the retail component of this project or to within the studio, the production space, or maybe equipped with the construction of the building. Because of the support of this project for this community, Los Angeles community as a whole, that we ask for a yes vote today. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Uh, yes, I am uh, going to be an appellate for uh, item 16, but I also have a public comment, uh, if that can be made. I'm speaking for my wife uh, as the appellate, but I have a public comment on my own. Can I do that? You can do public comment, um, but if you're speaking as an appellant, you would want to come when the item is being heard. And you said it was item 16? Yes. So I, I, I can do that at the same time or we're gonna, we're gonna give you a special time so hang tight and we'll call on you yeah Later. for item 16 yeah oh. we'll, we'll call you back by name uh, for he public. also wanted to use general public comment okay the public comment oh. uh, um you'll just come back when the item is being heard okay for 16 and you'll get three minutes if i'm not mistaken okay so we ask that all applicant and appellants wait until your item is heard, okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello, Lisa Sarkin, and I believe that I'm he I am here for the Studio City Neighborhood Council, and we put in a community impact statement, so I think I'm supposed to be speaking at the time of item 11. No, you, you can speak now. You just get more time, so you get three minutes now. That I had five minutes. It's only three. I don't know who's talking to me. Is it you, sir? Okay. Yes, it's I'm up here. Okay. So in this file, I Lisa Sarkin, Studio City Neighborhood Council. I'm also the first vice president of the Plan Review Board for the specific plan of Ventura Coanga Boulevard corridor. Um, I'm here also for the SCRA, the Studio City Residents Association, and the Studio City Neighborhood Council. In this file is either a community impact statement or a letter from every one of the neighborhood councils along the corridor. So that would be um, uh, Cahuenga Pass, Studio City, Sherman Oaks, Encino, Tarzana, Woodland Hills. And we all believe that there should be the 13 members as we put in our, all of our documents that were sent in. Um, there's, since 2017, the PRB put in a matrix relating to the amendments that we wanted from, uh, to go into the specific plan. And those amendments took all this time until they came before you. And in that time, the, uh, obviously, the districts changed. In the beginning, there were five districts when the specific plan was originally um, uh, became an ordinance, and now there's only two. So the specific plan states that all communities should have representation, but right now Encino doesn't have any representation because there's only two districts. So we feel that the only way that it's equitable and that it follows the specific plan is that our two members from each of the communities, one chosen by the district and one chosen by their neighborhood councils. At the time that the specific plan was last uh, updated was in 2001, and at, at that point, the neighborhood councils were not going on. So Council Member Kikorian and his staff correctly suggested the makeup of the, P, P, um, the PRB to include what I just told you, and that is how, what everyone else that is in this file wants the communities you need to be in the community to be able to represent it nobody that doesn't use ventura boulevard all the time cannot possibly know what's needed there we're not just a, re a review i mean a plan we're a plan review board not a, um i'm sorry i thought i had more time so um, 
we're not just a review of design. We have millions of dollars that we can appropriate or suggest to appropriate for things. And it's, we're totally different than a design review board. And we need the representation from two for, from each of the communities in case there's somebody that can't come and some, some big deal comes up and it's really important and that's what we would really like you to change the motion to say. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Before the next speaker begins, I will call a few more names. Judith Emigon, Kendra Casper, Maria Aguilar, Olivia Tinson, Omar Galindo, Rick Garcia, Roberto Huerta. Please line up to your left-hand side. If you are an applicant or appellant, we ask that you wait until your item is being heard. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Brenda Campos and I'm glad to see you guys again. I come back uh, this time because I really like to get your support uh, for this uh, item, the number 13. I came many times and I really like to get your support because uh, we came on in, it's not solo for entertainment, but also a square full stage to employ in entertainment in industry, men and women. So please vote yes and support those in this film, industry and for Hollywood growth and developer. Please help us to support this item, item 13. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Yeah, and I have another item, item number two. I like to support. Can I? You have you have yes. a little bit of time left, so you can go. Okay, I please. I really like to ask you to revoke the license for these uh, motels. Please help up because it's really bad uh, to see my kids walking in the street and so these bad things uh, near to the uh, school and it's not fair to the oldest can see in the uh, last days maybe a lot of bad stuff in, in the area, especially in Figueroa. In the Boulevard Motel, they don't need to work uh, no more. Please close the doors, or oh, I don't know in which language. I lo digo en español. Por favor, ayúdenos a cerrar y no revocarles las, quitarles la licencia. Take their license away. Please. Please. Um, in English or in Spanish, but please support us to don't let these people open more the doors. Please. Thank you so much for your support. Have a nice day. Thank you, speaker. Um, hi, uh, council members and committee. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Carlos Leon. I would like to speak on number two. You may begin. Uh, my name is Carlos Leon, a South LA native and organizer with Community Coalition. Uh, I am against the disrespectful appeal of Boulevard Motel and ask for an immediate shutdown again and again and again. And we'll continue to show up multiple times if we need to on a rainy day. I am here with several community members representing thousands of South LA residents whose lives have been damaged, destroyed, and put at risk due to the neglect and negative impact of this nuisance business that contributes to the poor socioeconomic conditions that exploit young girls as young as 14 years old on our streets for, for sex trafficking, drug trafficking, and the disregard of their lives and our lives. We do not need the predatory Boulevard Motel. We do not need motels on Figueroa Quarter. We desperately deserve and need affordable housing, community centers, parks, senior centers, and things that of well-being that benefit our community. Please deny the appeal and put people over profit today. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. You may begin. Hello, Council Parsons. I am here for number two general. My name is Olivia Payne Tenson. I am a member of the Community Coalition, and I am asking that you agree that the Boulevard Motel, with any and all similar land used to the subject property, 
that is not serving our community in any and all ways. It is observed in in and out uh, traffic, trashy activities, and our community right now is suggesting that you remove the Boulevard Motel, make our community with the support with items like the other communities have, and even for an even playing, and in our case, living, living feel with real time uh, affordable living. Thank you for your time. I am Olivia Payne Tenson. Thank you, Speaker. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Mi nombre es Mireya. My name is Mireya. Vivo en el Sur Centro. I live in South Central. Y estoy aquí para solicitarles de la manera más atenta al distrito al que pertenece este hotel del punto 2 del Hotel Boulevard. And I'm here to ask in the most respectful way possible que se de regarding, cuenta, que regarding se de, Boulevard uh, Motel. Que se de cuenta, por favor, que ese corredor no deja nada de motivación para los niños, para nuestro futuro. That, it, that corridor leaves nothing good for our children, for our future. Quiero pedirle, por favor, que lo cierren definitivamente y que en su lugar se construyan escuelas, centros uh, para adultos mayores, bibliotecas, and I'm asking you to close it and build in its place schools, centers for senior citizens, libraries. Que sea un corredor próspero, no que tenga delincuencia y que no se siga viendo tanta cosa fea que se ve en esa área. I'm asking for it to become a prosperous corridor uh, without delinquency, without these horrible things that we're seeing. Uh, muchas gracias. Eso es todo. Thank you so much. Thank you, Speaker. Before the next speaker begins, I will call a few more names. Tequila Richmond, <coughs> Teresa AVL, Sue Ling, Stephen Luffman, Roy Payan. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Mi nombre es Judith Amigo. Y eh, venimos puede... aquí con todos mis compañeros. Perdón, a... señora. Que Señora, por estas cartas que les comunicamos que cierren I'm asking through letters, uh, we are asking Boulevard about the hotel much, on Ferro, the motel Boulevard. Hay mucha, mucha prostitución y, There's a lot of prostitution. Y hay muchas personas que se quejan de ahí por. There's a lot of. Y que está y que que están muy con poca ropa todas las personas que salen de ahí there's people there with very little clothing necesitamos que cierren es, esa zona eso, esos hotel, moteles there's prostitution there's okay. terrible things in that zone I'm asking for it to be closed y hay mucho ruido y mucha prostitución there's lots of noise and lots of prostitution y la, y la gente que vive ahí se han quejado the people who live there have complained que, que van a las escuelas Que los que van a la escuela ahí cerca los niños uh, the people who live near there they complain about going to school with their children y pienso que debían de cerrar esos hoteles and I think those hotels should be closed para mejor de la comunidad que vivimos ahí for the benefit of the community that lives there que pongan más pues parques para que tengan los niños que Instead no ver todas esas parks. cosas and other things. Gracias. Thank you. Buenas tardes a todos. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Me llamo Roberto Huerta. My soy name is Roberto Huerta. De la, y soy miembro de la comunidad donde está cerca lo que es el Motel Boulevard. And I want to talk about the Motel Boulevard. Y estoy aquí precisamente planteando el mismo problema I'm here que, precisely talking about the same problem y disculpen que seamos reincidentes and I'm sorry but we're residents pero es que este problema ha sido ha sido visto discutido pero también ha sido seguido and this has been an issue that has been talked about that has been discussed para but it's poder, also an issue that continues 
y por eso es que nosotros hemos, hemos buscado consenso y es un problema que de consenso se ha planteado y por eso lo estamos insistiendo en plantear acá. And this is an issue that we've found consent on and that's the problem. Uh, no there's a reason that it's... No estamos en contra de lo que es We're not against hotel, hotels. Los interesa lo que es la empresa. We're interested in the economy. Pero tampoco no podemos estar de brazo cruzado. But we also ver, can't have our arms crossed. Al ver de que en esa calle de la Figueroa se desarrolla escena de inmoralidad de and see that on that street on Figueroa there's just a display of vulgarity. Yo pienso que bueno sugerirle a todos estos dueños de estos moteles que es necesario hacer negocio de una manera este, eh, honesta I would y like, esperemos pues que de los buenos oficios de ustedes para que este problema lo podamos resolver. I would Gracias. Like to ask the owners of these motels to conduct business in an honest way and I'm asking you guys uh, uh, with your work and support to help us. Thank you very much. Thank you, speaker. Before the next speaker begins, I will call the last few names. Marjan Abu Abubo, Marie, no last name, Menzar Farohar, Lucy Moreno, Lee Wallach, Kevin Scott, Jeff Bree, Jean Hutchinson, Eleanor Collins and Albert Kim. If you are an applicant or appellant, we ask that you wait until your item is heard. If your, if your name was just called, please line up to the left-hand side. Good afternoon. My name is Omar Galindo with UA Plumbers Local 78. And we are here today to ask for your supporting votes on the Echelon Studios projects, item 13 and 14. This project and its applicants should, have, should be taken as a models as other projects yet to come. It is a testament to truly understanding the importance of supporting the local community and the local economy by hiring locally and committing to living wages. We urge you to support good paying jobs by voting yes and approving this project. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Rick Garcia and I'm here on behalf of the Sheet Metal Workers Local Union number 105. Uh, we're here in support of the Echelon Studio Project. This project will provide a lot to the city and will do so while having the supported the skills, uh, skilled and trained workforce. The applicant has committed to hiring local skilled workers like us. That in turn is a commitment to the city which means so much. Please support this project and support us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, speaker. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Queen Tequila. I'm here with Community Coalition and Make Law, which is Make LA Whole. I want to share a little bit about my story. I'm um, at 11 years old. I was one of the victims of human trafficking, but I didn't have a pimp. I just had to survive. Now, today I've heard everyone speak against prostitution and against the young ladies of our area, which is South Los Angeles, which are where I reside. Um, I feel that instead of banishing them and um, looking down on them, that they should create some type of a resource so that the young ladies, such as myself, I was lucky to get out of the lifestyle, 20 years of human trafficking. Um, that's a, a lot of girls that are not able to make it out of that lifestyle. So I would like to see LA make some type of resource instead of locking them up and throwing away the key, uh, create a resource so that the young ladies can have some type of uh, stability, some type of house and some type of something without having to subject themselves to the street life. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Stephen Luffman, I'm speaking on item number three. I ask that you remove this from the consent and table it for further study. The people of Los Angeles have no idea what's in the proposal, proposed agreement as no aspect of this settlement has been made public. The striking Beaux-Arts style B'nai B'rith Lodge, AFL Teamster Hall, at the heart of this agreement is an important and irreplaceable historic resource identified in both the Westlake Redevelopment Survey and Survey LA's Historic Context Statement for Jewish History. 
It tells the story of Los Angeles' Jewish community, the Teamsters Union seeking a better life for its members in a notorious anti-union city, and the struggles of African Americans to integrate that union. Table this item, read the historic cultural monument application, which was prohibited uh, for presentation by Catholic charities before you vote on it. Thank you, speaker. Before the next speaker begins, we had two people just sign up, um, Haiti Campos and Tony Marrera. May you please line up to the left-hand side as we take the last few speakers. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Scott, and I'm a housing advocate. I am a volunteer with Abundant Housing LA, and I'm actually a uh, project uh, member for the for the a team working on item 16 on Kelton. Um, and I don't live in Palms, but I'm going to read some comments from my friend Nolan Gray, who does. So he says, as a resident of Palms, a professional city planner, and a housing affordability advocate, I respectfully urge the council to deny this appeal and approve the density bonus and related incentives for 3676 Kelton. Our neighborhood, like Los Angeles as a whole, suffers from an extreme shortage of housing Developers like the ones at 3676 Kelton are essential to closing that gap, especially the 11 units that would be reserved for very low income families. Palms is uniquely well served by transit and is close to many of the city's major job centers. Uh, and as a resident, a, a resident of this building can easily live car light or car free, just like I do, uh, and I speak from experience. So if we're serious about climate change, we need to address this. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon, members of the council. My name is Marie Sullivan. I'm representing LA Metro, uh, here to speak on item number five, the District NoHo project. LA Metro is the property owner for this site. Uh, this is our third busiest LA Metro station and our biggest joint development project to date with um, nearly 1,500 housing units. Um, so I'd like to thank Trammell Crow Company for their partnership on this on this project for over nearly eight years. They've been a terrific partner on this extremely complex project. I'd like to thank Council President Krikorian and his staff for their leadership on this project um, and remind everyone that since 2015, when I began on this project, that we've uh, worked with the community who has uh, been very interested in an intensive urban project that um, integrates um, work play and um, family oriented uh, retail and restaurant options and we are finally delivering on what will be an exemplary transit oriented community at this station. So strong support for the project, thanks. Thank you, speaker. <clears throat> Good afternoon, my name is Jeff Bree. I'm here on behalf of the Iron Workers Local 433 and we would like to express our support for item number 14 <clears throat> and ask for your support as well. We are excited about this project because it will provide good paying jobs, hire local residents, and use responsible contractors. We are proud to support this project and strongly urge you to support it too. Vote yes and approve this project. Thank you. regarding item number 16, the Kelton Project. Uh, I've lived in the Palms neighborhood for 50 years. Uh, at the first neighborhood meeting I attended regarding this project, Jesse, the representative for the developer, stated that all the neighborhoods in Los Angeles must do their share for lack of affordable housing. I think Palms has done more than its share. I wonder if everyone on this, anyone on this committee hit, has visited our neighborhood. We have at least eight very, very, very high density buildings on Overland between Venice and Palms. More, most are more than six stories in height. The Roy, the Jaeger, the Venue, the Tilofs, and others that don't have names yet. Single apartments in these buildings are renting for 3,000 a month. There is also a huge project under construction on Venice and Gelden, Glendon. Also multiple buildings on my street are enclosing parking spaces and turning them into uh, rentable units. 
I respectfully request that the council deny the variances which are extreme. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Tony Morera. Uh, I am also here for item 16 on the agenda regarding the uh, 3676 and 3704 Kelton Avenue uh, planning approval. Um, I just want to say that as a professional architect in the city of Los Angeles and elsewhere in California, um, I am uh, in complete solidarity with people opposed uh, to the current uh, status for approval of this project. It is completely out of scale with everything in the neighborhood. It will surely in the future uh, make people move from their single family residence and small apartments because they don't want to be next to something that is so proportionately uh, um, uh, discordant with, with what's there now. Um, really in my practice in 45 years, I have never seen so many concessions on a project ever, ever, and that's really something. I've built dozens of uh, single family residences, apartments, public buildings, and never have I seen concessions like have been approved on this building so far. Thank you, Speaker. And this is our last speaker, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm here just to um, speak a little bit on project number seven. I know nobody else I think has. Um, I'm a homeowner on Columbus Avenue. And I'm a homeowner three doors down from where you plan to put in a six story, 400 unit apartment building. And several years ago, we had an agreement that on that particular lot on Columbus, a four, only a four unit condominium could be built there. And that's why the community came up and we accepted the zoning change. Now this, so does that mean that your word means absolutely nothing? Because that's what we agreed upon. And this study that says 400 units and all you do is 500 parking spaces, that's a joke. My lot, my, my street right now, you can't get a parking spot. You can't get a parking spot for two blocks because of the apartment, the, all, the, all the apartment buildings on Sepulveda. And if you Thank think you, that- Thank you, Speaker. Uh, that was your time. Thank you, that's your time. Th thank you, that means that you stop talking. And that concludes public comment. All right, thank you to everybody who came out to share uh, public comment with us today. Uh, that, uh, Mr. Mejias, will take us to our consent uh, items. If we could uh, read those into the record and call the roll. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, the items on consent are items three, seven through 10 and 13. Item three, it's a city attorney report relative to, to a Settlement agreement between Catholic Charities of Los Angeles and the city. Recommendation is to approve the settlement recommendations. Item seven, <clears throat> it's the recommendation is to approve the environmental clearance, the sustainable communities environmental assessment, the SCIA and the findings <coughs> that are contained in the planning department report dated February 14th, 2024 in as much as the proposed project is a transit priority project and thereby exempt from CEQA. Item eight, recommendations to approve the CAO recommendation in its report dated December the 13th, 2023, to, to authorize the planning department to execute a con contract extensions with two contractors, iStone Environmental and Terry Hayes Associates, for the continued provision of environmental consulting services and extend the contract duration as noted in the CAO report by 18 and 28 months and which do not add any additional compensation. Item number nine, the uh, recommendation is to approve the city attorney prepare ordinance 
dated November the 3rd, 2023. Uh, this is for a development agreement between the city, with, rather between City Market of Los Angeles, Inc. and, uh, and the city. And item number 10, it's a recommendation to approve the environmental clearance, the sustainable communities environmental assessment, the SCIA, the findings, the errata containing the planning department report dated February the 14th, 2023, in as much as the project is a transit priority project and thereby exempt from CEQA. I will call the roll on those items. Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. Yes. That's five, member, five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Mejia. Now we'll go to uh, item number one and hear from our fearless leader of the Department of City Planning, Mr. Vince Bertoni. Um, I will, can I postpone this to the next meeting? I apologize. You want to postpone to the next meeting? Uh, yeah, that's the, the update on the new uh, deputy director. Okay. Yeah, yeah, apologize. We have to double, do double duty. On the All right, we'll note and file that um, and go to our next item. Uh, yes, sir, item number two. On the regular agenda, this is a categorical exemption from CEQA and the related findings, a report from the planning department as to the recommendation to discontinue the motel use, Boulevard Motel, and the imposition of conditions and an appeal filed by Yashivi Hospitality LLC. All right, we'll have a, a report from the Department of City Planning and other staff, city staff. Good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Iris One, city planner. Item number two pertains to an appeal to the zoning administrator's determination to discontinue a motel known as the Boulevard Motel, which is a one-story, 3,038 square foot building consisting of 11 motel guest rooms and 12 parking spaces located at 6919 and 6923 South Figueroa Street in 8th Council District. On December 27th, 2023, the zoning administrator issued a determination discontinuing the subject motel and imposed five conditions related to reimbursement of fees, covenant recordation, and change in ownership. The subject business has generated numerous community complaints, aided crimes, endangered public safety, and has required consistent police enforcement as evidenced by submissions from the Los Angeles Police Department crime reports over a three-year period, which includes at least 79 calls for service, 59 investigative and arrest reports pertaining to prostitution, human trafficking, convicted felon with firearms, assault with deadly weapons, illegal possession of firearms, supervising and aiding prostitution, loitering for prostitution, battery on police officers, robbery, vandalism, grand theft, battery, pimping, violence with injuries, theft from motor vehicle, disputes, disturbance with gun, drug overdose, aggravated assault, engaging and soliciting for prostitution, disorderly house, and more. Out of the 35 investigative reports, more than 20 incidents clearly indicate the crimes occurred on the motel premises, including the guest rooms or in the motel parking lot. In addition, planning staff received more than 41 letters and emails from local residents, the Gil Garcetti Learning Academy, the KIPP Empower Academy, and parents of students who attend these schools within walking distance of the motel, who are all in favor of revoking the motel use at the subject site. On January 8, 2024, the owner-operator of the Boulevard Motel filed an appeal of the entire decision of the zoning administrator's determination, challenging the following. Violation of First Amendment, Petition and Grievances Clause, Association Clause, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Search and Seizure Clause, Fifth Amendment, Takings Clause, Fourteenth Amendment, due process clause and equal protection clause, that there is no credible evidence that the subject motel has or is operating in violation of any local, state, or federal law, or has operated as a public nuisance. And even if the subject motel is operating as a nuisance, the discontinuance of use is oppressive and not proportional and violates substantive due process and other constitutional provisions. That the zoning administrator pretextually discontinue the motel use which places the appellant out of business and will cause great economic and personal harm. 
The appeal justifications of constitutional amendments cannot be substantiated at this time, and the owner operator's written justification of the appeal has been transferred to council file number 24-0052 for your consideration. The zoning administrator's action to discontinue the motel use is a result of LAPD crime reports, citizen complaints, and testimony which indicate that activities at the subject location have resulted in impacts to the community at large. These impacts have been associated with the operation of the premises, and there is a lack of sufficient oversight at the property. The activities taking place at the site deprive residents and other community members of their rightful ability to enjoy their neighborhood. Furthermore, there have been prior go governmental efforts with the attempt to abate nuisances at the location when a lawsuit was filed by the city attorney's office in 2004. In 2006, the Superior Court of Los Angeles County found that the motel operated in violation of the red light abatement law. As evidenced by crime reports provided by LAPD, nuisance activities continued on the premises after the city attorney's action despite a change in property ownership. Staff recommendation is to deny the appeal and uphold the zoning administrator's determination. This concludes my presentation and I'm available for any questions you may have. And we do have LAPD vice officers that are present to provide testimony. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. We'll hear from our uh, representatives from Los Angeles Police Department at this time. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Al Navarro. I'm a Sergeant and the officer in charge of the 77th Street Division Vice Unit. Uh, I'm gonna be very <coughs> brief and then I'll turn over the mic to my partner, but I would like to briefly just state that uh, I think one of the speakers here earlier said it best. On our end, we're not here to deprive somebody of, of a motel use or, or to make a living. But the problem is that another speaker also mentioned to the fact that that motel and all the others there, and by the way, we're not lumping them together. We're making independent observations of all of them. They all fall into this category. There aren't regular citizens that are going to be a tourist here in LA using these motels. The unfortunate part is that all these motels are attracting a certain element, and that is one of the biggest uses of it is to uh, enhance and, and continue the activities of prostitution. If you can imagine the motel, it sits between 69th Street and 70th Street, dead center. It's less than a half a football field away from two of the bus busiest corners we have in 77th Street. So these motels enable this activity to continue because it's so easy to come to an, Ill an illegal contract to pay money for sex and then you walk less than a half a football field away to, to conduct this kind of activity. And yes, we do see the churches, there's a school two blocks over. We see the little kids, I mean, you're talking, we're walking them by the hand to go to school and they're seeing a half naked to, to even less sometimes than that. Females there, unfortunately, they're victims as well. We're not pointing fingers and trying to make them suspects here. The unfortunate part is they are naked and these children are seeing this. It degrades the, the quality of life of that community. It attracts every other crime that you can think of, including shootings, shootings with hits, robberies, carjackings. These are all numbers that are available to you, but they are a fact of life in 77th Street. Uh, the mayor did a ride along with us that past Saturday and I provided her with a heat map that I don't have with me, but if you were to look at the shooting, shooting with hits and robberies, they fall dead center along the Figueroa corridor. Literally, if you took this activity out of 77th Street Division, our crime would drop by 35%. That, that's a significant number, and it's being enabled by these motels along the Figueroa corridor. So that's why we're here to shed some light onto what the activity is along that street. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you guys very much for having the Los Angeles Police Department here today. My name is uh, Officer Armendariz, again, representing the LAPD. Just a little bit of background on myself before we dive into this. Um, I was born and raised here in Los Angeles. I still currently reside here in Los Angeles. So this is an issue that's kind of near and dear to my heart. This year, I hit six years as a police officer with the LAPD. Most of my career I've spent down in South Central Los Angeles assigned to 77th Street Division, which is the division that covers uh, the area of the Boulevard Motel. I have worked patrol majority of my career, both the overnight shifts as well as the daytime shifts. And for the past year, I've been assigned to our division's vice unit. 
The vice units, for those of you guys that don't know what we do, just to explain it to you really quick, uh, vice units all throughout the city, we deal with public order crimes like illegal gambling, the illegal sales of alcohols, prostitution, among many other things. Um, the thing that makes 77th Street Division Vice a little bit more different than the entire other 21 geographical divisions is that we're in charge of handling the blatant prostitution activity that occurs along the Figueroa Corridor. So we were advised by the U.S. Marshals not too long ago that the Figueroa Corridor is now the biggest prostitution ring in the United States of America. So that area belongs to that little strip of South Central LA where we work and where a lot of these guys live. Um, if you guys haven't had the unfortunate opportunity to go ahead and take a look at Figueroa, I'll just paint a quick little picture for you guys. You guys could drive out there right now in the rain. Um, you'll see females that are commercial sex workers, street walking prostitutes wearing little to no clothing. They're gonna be holding umbrellas right now because it's raining, but they're still out there. Um, we're gonna have kids walking up and down the blocks trying to get to school and lines that resemble in and out and McDonald's lines late at night with uh, sex buyers attempting to purchase sex from these women that are out there. So residents are unable to pull out of their driveways or they have to wait an extended period of time just to pull out of their driveways and go to work because of this nuisance that we have there. This prostitution is an absolute plague to this community who go to work, take their kids to school, and are just trying to earn a decent living. And one of these problem motels that attribute to all of the issues along the Figueroa Corridor is the Boulevard Motel, located just off of 69th Street and Figueroa Street, uh, 6919 South Figueroa Street. I personally have seen street walking prostitutes at every hour of the day. Like I said, I work both overnight and day watch hours coming out of the Boulevard Motel, either bringing in clientele or, or walking them out at the completion of their services. The Boulevard Motel is a part of the many motels that are along the Figueroa Corridor and is used so much by the prostitutes, pimps, traffickers because of the conveniency of the location. As my sergeant said, it sits in the middle of two of our busier corners, 69th Street and 70th Street, so it is used extremely heavily. It's plagued with prostitution and prostitution-related activity like pimping and pandering, so the residents see that on a constant, everyday basis. Our unit, as well as with the combined efforts of patrol, have rescued 12 juveniles so far this year along the Figueroa Corridor, our youngest being 12 years old and our oldest being 17 years old. Our youngest girls, a 12-year-old and a 13-year-old, we went ahead and rescued a couple feet away from the Boulevard Motel exactly 10 days ago on February 10th at 4.30 in the morning. A 12 and a 13-year-old. It's my understanding that the Boulevard Motel was asked to uh, begin checking for identification to allow law enforcement personnel access to their surveillance and to put up a gate. I just want to make it known to you guys that they did put up a gate and they did give us access to their cameras. Uh, however, the gate isn't being closed at the hours that it's supposed to be. We're still seeing a lot of prostitution activity coming in and out of the Boulevard Motel. The motel itself, as I stated earlier, is along the Figueroa Corridor. It's surrounded by a residential home to the left of it and an apartment building to the right of it. It's smack in the middle of two of our busiest corners, 6-9 and 7 -0. And across the street are more apartment complexes, homes, a senior living center, and a senior living recreational center. It is less than a two minute walk from 68th Street Elementary School at 612 West 68th Street. Uh, that's exactly 0 0.1 miles away from the elementary school where young kids are looking at this every single day. I personally responded to calls for service from community members numerous times at the Boulevard Motel as well as within the direct vicinity of the motel. I've responded there for robberies, thefts, assault with deadly weapons, rapes, fights, unknown disturbances, and many other violent crimes. Following investigations, when I go up to their window, uh, many times they provide me with incomplete registration cards, which makes it difficult for me to continue on with my investigation. 
In 2023, patrol officers at 77th Street Division received 38 calls for service with the Boulevard Motel as a direct hit, meaning that the crimes occurred either inside of the room, inside of the parking lot, or directly outside of the establishment. They were calling 911 reporting crimes, like I said earlier, ADW, shootings, robberies. So these kinds of statistics raise concerns because of how close the Boulevard Motel is in relation to 68th Street Elementary School. On February 5th, our 77th Vice Unit made an arrest for solicitation for prostitution. When we monitored that female after citing her and advising her to leave the area, she walked to the Boulevard Motel where we observed that she had a room. She met with another street walking prostitute who had a separate room on that date uh, we observed her walk a sex buyer into the room. So unfortunately, the prostitution activity has not ceased at the Boulevard Motel. Patrol has recovered firearms and narcotics from the Boulevard Motel. In July of 2023, officers observed two persons ingesting illegal drugs inside of their vehicle that was parked inside of the Boulevard Motel. And in August of 2023, officers initiated a traffic stop inside of the Boulevard Motel where they recovered a firearm from an ex-convict. And this goes without saying, but prostitution isn't a victimless crime. It's one of the biggest ways children are trafficked off into the sex trade. And it's also one of the biggest displays, displays of moral decay and total neglect of citizens of the community. It sets a negative precedent and allows for acceptance to other lawless behaviors such as pimping, pandering, drug use, drug sales, among many other that plagued the South Central community. These are extremely troubling times right now and we should be doing everything we can to build our communities up instead of tearing them down. And in my opinion, the South Central community should remain steadfast and adamant at curbing the disgraceful appeal of blatant prostitution along the Figueroa Corridor. And this begins with the revocation of the license of the Boulevard Motel because it is a problem motel that condones these types of activities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation. Now we'll hear from the applicant. Good afternoon. Frank Weiser on behalf of the uh, appellants, uh, uh, the LLC, and the individual members of the LLC. Um, I, I'm assuming that I'm going to have the 15 minutes. You, you're going to have three minutes. Pardon me? You're going to have three minutes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to raise a point here, and I've raised it before for procedural due process purposes, is the redacted reports. I was not the attorney at the time of the uh, zoning administrator hearing, but I understand that the same type of reports uh, that have been used in other hearings uh, uh, that I've attended to or that I've uh, litigated uh, were the same rep type of reports, in other words, redacted information, police calls, uh, calls for service that were redacted and all that I believe does not give a meaningful opportunity uh, for purposes of due process a case that supports that is US Supreme Court case 1965 Armstrong versus Mazo Manzo 380 US at 545 and page 552 uh, so that evidence should have been allowed in I do know from personal experience that this particular associate zoning administrator in another motel uh, that uh, I defended uh, last year uh, with Mr. Lum, who was also the planner uh, prior to our Zoom hearing. Uh, on that matter, I heard the associate administrator saying, I'm going to give them as much time as they need because I know it's going to go up on appeal uh, and I don't want that coming back to us. So I think that this administrator uh, or this associate zoning administrator has shown bias in the past to other motels and I think that infects the whole process here. With respect to Mr. Lum, I understand from my clients that on September 1st, 2023, he entered the motel with another zoning uh, associate and uh, demanded to see a room. Uh, that room was open to him uh, because my client did not have any choice to do so. Pictures were taken, a search was made, and that evidence was used in the proceedings. So I think that also raises a Fourth Amendment issue that that evidence and the process itself has been affected. Now, going to the substance of the case itself, uh, 
well, I do want one other point. There are two other police officers who have testified here today who were never disclosed to us. It's my understanding, according to the rules here, this is not a de novo hearing. Uh, so, number one, new evidence shouldn't be uh, allowed to be in, uh, uh, brought in, but we were certainly not notified ahead of time that they would be testifying on what the f substance of the testimony would be. So that also raises an issue of due process. Now, going to the substance, this motel, like the other motels in the corridor, there were two reports that appeared on NBC uh, four and Spectrum last year, late last year. One was on November 15th. It was done by an investigative reporter, Lolita Lopez, who uh, interviewed me, my client, at uh, another motel. And we said, I said at that point, uh, that we do not support criminal activity, prostitution, drug activity. We're all in favor of the city enforcing their laws to make sure that uh, there's no crime in the, in the communities. Nobody wants trafficking in their community. But the question is, where is the responsibility here for the trafficking that's going on? This is a problem that's been going on for years and years and years in the Figueroa Corridor. I litigated two published opinions before Judge Aurelia Munoz in 2006 and 2008 for a, a motel uh, in which the issue came up and Judge Muno said on the record to the police. You should, you should go to your concluding thoughts. How much time would I have left? None. Well, once again, that, that, that's the issue. Uh, you give them 15 minutes and you don't give us uh, the requisite amount of time. So I think that, you know, that's going to raise an equal. Thank you. All right. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll go to discussion. I'll open it up to members of the council. But I just want to thank uh, our city departments and uh, particularly our two uh, officers from who've been working on Figueroa uh, with us for several months now on Operation Fig. We appreciate your testimony, appreciate your diligence in sticking to the issue. Uh, and and uh, I appreciate that because during my lifetime, Figueroa has been a problem from the time I could read or watch the news. Um, and lots of community groups, including me as a young community organizer almost 25 years ago, have been trying to deal with this uh, problem and really get the city to enforce the laws that we already have on the books uh, with regard to these businesses and with regard to these activities that are on, on going on in the corridor. And so it's, I applaud you because it's real easy to give up or not do a good job because you figure like, it's always been this way, it's always gonna be this way. And, and that is not the case. And so I especially appreciate your work uh, here today and the, the, the work of the zoning administrator. I mean, you, you all saw in the record, there are hearings that go back almost 20 years that you cited in, in your report that the neighborhood's been dealing with this activity. So I um, thank all of you uh, for your work and thank the residents who came uh, to speak to us uh, today, uh, one resident st said in, in Spanish that it was a disrespectful demonstration of vulgarity every day and every night uh, in the heart of our community. And so I could go on. Uh, you all have cited the, the, um, cited the conditions, I thought, well and very, very thoroughly. And I think given this committee what we need to, uh, to move forward uh, with the denial of the appeal from the uh, Boulevard Hotel. Any other comments, uh, members? All right, uh, with that, uh, Mr. Mejia, if you can, uh, I'll move that we deny, if, uh, you can call the roll, Mr. Mejia. Uh, yes, so the recommendation is to deny the um, appeal and thereby sustain the zoning administrator's determination to discontinue the motel use, the Boulevard Motel. Um, I will call the roll, Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee? Aye. Ms. Jaroslawski? Yes. Ms. Padilla? Yes. Ms. Hutt? Yes. Uh, five members are unanimous. Mr. Excellent. It's unanimous. Thank you, <laughs> colleagues. Thank you, uh, members of city planning. Thank you, officers. Uh, we'll see you soon. All right, that takes us to item number five. Uh, yes, sir. Item five includes a previously certified environmental impact report and a report from the city attorney to amend the municipal, the municipal code to approve a draft ordinance to add a new zone, the district NoHo specific plan zone, and a second ordinance to establish the district NoHo specific 
plan. This is for a mixed-use development project in CD2. The third ordinance for the sign district is forthcoming and not pending before committee today. All right, we have a report on this item. Good afternoon, this is Melania Sachin, Department of City Planning. Um, the project uh, has two ordinances before you, the code amendment and the specific plan. Um, we recommend that the uh, modifications that were presented by the applicant for some text changes to the specific plan be incorporated into any recommendation. Uh, all right, any questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, I'll move that we adopt the recommendations. We could read those into the record and call the roll. Yes, and uh, one more thing, if we can also for the record state to request the city attorney to incorporate the technical amendments that, are, that were stated by the city planner into the sign district ordinance that is forthcoming. Yes. I will call the roll. Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. Yes. Uh, five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. All right, that moves us to item number six. Uh, yes, uh, item six, um, Mr. Harris Dawson. This is a communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Mr. N Michael Newhouse to the City Planning Commission. All right, uh, we're joined, fortunate <coughs> enough to be joined by Mr. Newhouse today. If you'll just give us a, a brief introduction of uh, yourself and uh, what you hope to accomplish on behalf of your fellow Angelinos by serving us in this capacity. Yeah, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I know how busy you all are, so I'll be uh, brief. I'll be quick about this. Uh, my name is Mike Newhouse, uh, and I had the pleasure of serving on the West Los Angeles Area Planning Commission uh, as their president for five years, uh, from 2017 to 2022. I also served as the president of the Venice Neighborhood Council before that for a couple of years. So I've tried to keep myself uh, active uh, on behalf of Los Angeles and the community for a long time. Uh, professionally, I am an attorney. Uh, I uh, have a land use and planning practice as well as a, a real estate practice. So um, I have a heavy background over the last 25 years um, in these sorts of issues. And they're issues that I, I care about very deeply. Uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, I was uh, humbled and, and pleased to get the call from the mayor's office uh, about this opportunity. Uh, I look forward to hopefully serving in that capacity. I think we have a, a wonderful opportunity right now at this time in the city to look at, you know, what's our future going to look like? How are we going to build more housing? How are we going to build more affordable housing? How are we going to shelter people? And what's, uh, what's Los Angeles going to look like from a planning perspective uh, for the next generation? Uh, and I really love the work I did on the Area Planning Commission, uh, and I look forward to doing it on a bit of a larger scale. Thank you so much. Uh, questions or comments, members? All right. Seeing none, uh, Mr. Mejia, can we call the roll? Uh, yes. Uh, for item six, to the appointment of Mr. Newhouse, uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. Yes. Five members and unanimous. All right, it's unanimous. We'll see you in full council. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Mr. Uh, Harris Dawson, with your indulgence, um, I need to make a correction on the previous item, uh, number five, on the ordinances for the mixed use project in CD2. The technical corrections are to the specific plan ordinance rather than the sign district ordinance. Got it. So that needs to be reflected in the record. Thank so you. noted. Thank you. And I, I'll call the roll out of uh, caution. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Uh, Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. Yes. And one more time, Mr. Lee. Aye. Uh, thank you. Five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. All right. Please. That takes us to item number 11. Yes, sir. Item 11, um, categorical exemption from seek when a report from the Planning Commission relative to proposed amendments to the Ventura Cahuenga Boulevard Corridor specific plan. All right. We have a report from Department of City Planning. Good afternoon, council members, members of the public. 
My name is Lauren Paddock, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Courtney Schoenwald, Priya Mahendele, and David Olivo. Today, I will be sharing a brief presentation about the proposed amendment to the Ventura Coenga specific plan. The amendment is centered around a few key goals. First, streamlining signage review to be more business friendly. Second, updating the section regarding the plan review board which is a board that makes recommendations on how money from the specific plan's transportation trust fund is spent. As a result of the 2020 redistricting process, the board was so reduced in size that not all the communities within the corridor were represented. Our goal was to ensure that the appointment process centers equitable community representation and membership diversity. Another issue is that department roles when working with the board are not clear so we are trying to add clarity to that section of the plan. We have also updated the language of the plan to fix typos, update code references, and reference recently adopted ordinances. In addition, maps associated with the plan have been updated so they're accurate and legible. The new process of reviewing science will be a more efficient use of staff resources and time while ensuring compliance with the, the specific plan's sign standards. In alignment with Executive Directive 4, the amendment will help businesses by lowering fees and providing faster review timelines. The structure and administration of the Plan Review Board has been of interest, so we are going to discuss some of the concerns raised. Prior to crafting our proposal, we researched boards and commissions that the department works with we found that most boards are smaller in size, usually ranging from five to seven members. And we consistently found that the larger the board, the more difficulty it was to meet quorum. Larger boards also pose greater strain on staff resources and time. We are proposing that the Ventura Plan Review Board have one member per community in addition to a mayoral appointee for a total board size of seven members. The amendment does not propose changes to the current section designating one mayoral appointment, but rather changes the council appointments to be one member per community. Language was also added to provide guidance to ensure the board has a variety of lived experiences and perspectives. We also added language to require that greater notice is given to board members and council offices for upcoming membership term expirations. And per the modification from the City Planning Commission, will involve notifying the Neighborhood Council as well. We would like to end our presentation by sharing the goals of the specific plan itself. To ensure that Ventura Boulevard remains a premier commercial corridor with a healthy business community, and that all in the community are served by an updated and clear plan. And that concludes our presentation. We're available for any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, before we open it up to comments from members of the committee, uh, I want to uh, give an opportunity to the impacted council districts, which I think are three, four, and two, uh, to provide testimony. Hello again. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Elizabeth Enne. I'm the Planning and Economic Development Director for Council Member Bob Blumenfield. I'm here with my um, colleague, Michelle Majid, to comment on the Ventura Coenga specific plan amendment. Um, I want to take an opportunity to commend um, and appreciate the high level of engagement from community members um, and also planning staff. Uh, the Ventura Coenga specific plan was um, initiated in 2019 um, in response to a 2017 motion by council to achieve a more modern and streamlined regu regulatory process for the plan area. The amendment aims to simplify and reduce uh, time frame, the time frame of sign approval process, processes and other simple cases such as changes of use to assist local businesses and update uh, project impact fees and create flexibility for how those fees can be spent so they can apply to public realm improvements not currently allowed in the specific plan. Uh, the specific plan also establishes a plan review board. Uh, this advisory board is made up of members appointed by the council members whose district are within the specific plan area and the mayor. Currently under the adopted plan, there are two appointees per council district 
and an at-large member. Additionally, there is not a notification process from the department right now regarding the expiration of terms. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Michelle Majid, Deputy Chief of Staff for Councilmember Rahman. Uh, we'd also like to extend our gratitude to staff and community members. Following the 2021 redistricting process, two of the four council districts were no longer within the specific plan area, and therefore their respective appointees were no longer eligible to serve on the PRB. A year later, in November 2022, the Department of City Planning informed PRB members and council offices no longer within the specific plan area about their respective removals as a legal necessity based on the existing specific plan. Unfortunately, this, co this change was com uh, completed for some PRB members, but not others, and caused confusion and frustration. In order to correct representation issues caused by redistricting, Council Members Rahman and Blumenfield introduced a motion instructing the Planning Department to come up with equity-minded recommendations regarding PRB appointments based on communities within the specific plan area rather than council districts, clarity on term processes, and efforts to expand socioeconomic and demographic representation on the PRB. As part of this process, we asked DCP, or the Department of City Planning, to put together a comparative analysis and create a matrix of existing boards and commissions and their responsibilities. These recommendations were adopted by the City Planning Commission last fall, and now this matter is before you. Some community members have shared concerns that this number is still inadequate to represent the full scope of interest along Ventura Boulevard. Along with CPC's recommendations regarding appointments, which is one member per each of the six communities appointed by the council member who represents the majority of land area of each community within the specific plan area and one at-large member appointed by the mayor, we would like to respectfully request that there be one member appointed at-large by each of the council members of the districts in which the specific plan is located. If adopted under your purview, this would create a nine-member PRB to be appointed by the council members of the districts in which the specific plan is located, which are council districts three and four, and the mayor. Our offices want to ensure that this process concludes and new systems are in place before taking any final action around appointments. We hope all of the proposed amendments can move forward expeditiously so we can support small businesses um, along Ventura Boulevard and not leave communities in limbo. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Zaytunian, and I am with Council President Kerkorian's office. I am here to convey the Council President's support for Item 11, the Ventura Coenga Corridor Specific Plan Amendment. This amendment has been a long time coming since Council President's mo motion in September of 2017. The Ventura Coenga Boulevard Corridor Specific Plan was originally adopted over 30 years ago and last amended in 2001. The plan was drafted to help guide development in the commercial heart of the San Fernando Valley and specifically addresses the concerns of the residents most impacted by development along Ventura Boulevard. The amendment as proposed today aims to streamline the time frame of many permitting procedures in the plan area and will in turn allow for faster improvements of the public realm. It is, important, it is an important first step amongst a number of amendments that need improvement in the plan area, many of which our office with other council offices in the Valley had worked with community groups and, plan and the plan review board suggested to the planning department. Per the council president's December 2022 letter, we feel it is important to stress that this current and proposed makeup of the plan review board falls short in inclusion of different community perspectives. The council president recommends that the department further work on section 15.8.2. The council president would like to thank the Department of City Planning for their hard work on the, this plan amendment and hopes that the department continues to work on these improvements and further amend this specific plan per the community input that we have received in the last seven years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any discussion members? All right. Um, seeing none, I will um, move uh, that we request the city attorney to prepare and present this ordinance. Call the roll. Yes, Councilman, and one more thing, to also approve the technical corrections embedded in the yes. joint letter. Yes. Okay. Um, I will call the roll, sir. Um, Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Ms. Hutt. Yes. 
Ms. Padilla, was that a yes? That was a yes. Yes, uh, that's five members and unanimous. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that takes us to items 13 and 14, which we will hear together. We'll take separate votes, but we'll hear the item together, uh, beginning with a report from Department of City Planning. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Heather Bleemer, senior, senior city planner with the Department of City Planning, and I will be presenting items 13 and 14. These two council files before us are for the proposed redevelopment of the city block bounded by Santa Monica Boulevard, Wilton Place, Virginia Avenue, and St. Andrews Place for a new 510,000 square foot office and film production studio complex. The project will rise to a maximum height of 94 feet and will provide 981 vehicle parking spaces. Again, there are two council files for this project. The first, 23-1329, is for a draft ordinance to approve a zone and height district change on the subject property. The property is currently zoned C4-1VL along Santa Monica Boulevard and R4-1VL to the rear along Virginia Avenue. The project is requesting a zone change and height district change to C4-2 for the entirety of the site. The second council file, 23-1329-S1, is an appeal of a related vesting tentative track map to merge all the various lots comprising the property as well as to vacate a dead-end alley running through the middle of the site for one ground lot and seven airspace lots. The appellant is the applicant for this case, and they are appealing the City Planning Commission's denial of a request by the applicant to waive the dedication and roadway widening requirements for a portion of the property along Santa Monica Boulevard. This dedication and widening issue is really the only matter bringing the track map before us today. The project has otherwise had no opposition or other comments from the public and the City Planning Commission did approve all of the other requests and recommended for approval of the requested zone and height district change. I have reviewed the letter that Council District 13 um, submitted to Council file that supports the applicant's request to waive the highway dedication and roadway widening requirements for that portion along uh, Santa Monica Boulevard. And I do believe that overall, this is a beneficial project for the city and the region as a whole and would not be opposed if this committee chooses to follow that council office's actions and recommendations to waive the required highway dedication and roadway widening. And of course, planning recommends that this committee approve the requested zone and height district change and adopt the mitigated negative declaration under case number ENV 2021-7332 MND as the project's environmental clearance. That concludes my overview of the project and requested actions. I am available for any questions. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. We'll hear from the appellant now for three minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Plum Committee. My name is Kendra Casper and I represent the applicant for the project. Um, first, I wanna thank Heather um, and Morsong, our planner for the project, for all of their hard work. Um, as she said, our appeal today is only related to a request for a waiver of dedication, and it is also related to a, a request to merge a previously dedicated area back into the site. There was a previously dedicated area related to a project that was approved in 2006 that's never moved forward and has been terminated. And as such, this area has never been used and still sits, and we want to use it as part of our project to create an inviting and uh, pedestrian and friendly experience for our studio project. Um, I think today what we are asking is for the waiver to uh, the waiver of dedication to be approved and also to allow the merger um, to happen back into the site for the previously requested area. Um, I would like to request a clarification of uh, CD 13's letter related to uh, condition number one, uh, referring to a street vacation, which I don't understand um, why a street vacation would be required here. Uh, we're asking for a merger for the Subdivision Map Act, which is the same request for the alley that Ms. Bleemers just spoke about earlier. It's merging the alley back in, merging the dedicated area back in. Uh, there, it's both supported by uh, the government code, um, the Subdivision Map Act, section 66499.20.2. Uh, there's also California case law that specifically states that 
um, if there's already been a merger approved via the Subdivision Map Act, which we are asking for today, um, via a publicly noticeable hearing, which is the publicly noticed hearing today, um, then no separate street vacation process is required. That case is Citizens for a Responsible and Equitable Environmental Development uh, versus City of San Diego. Um, I think it's common practice for the city under both the municipal code and the track map to merge uh, areas into the site like we're doing with the alley. Uh, and as you could see from our commenters earlier, the project has a ton of support. We're ready to go. We're ready to construct this project. We're ready to take this site that's vacant um, and, and, and put something there that the community really supports as you heard from Mr. Doug Haynes earlier. Uh, we have full union support. We have our PLAs ready to go and our union workers are standing by ready to start the work. So that's what we're requesting today to let us move forward with this project that everybody seems to support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now we'll hear from Council District 13. Um, honorable members of the of the Plum Committee, my name is Rahali Pardo. I'm the Transportation Infrastructure Deputy for Council District 13. Um, and I'm here to speak on items 13 and 14. Our office submitted a letter earlier today with, uh, to the council files with greater detail for your consideration. Uh, this project is for the construction, use, and maintenance of film and television production studios, space that continues to be important and the cornerstone of Hollywood's past, present, and future economic growth. The reason for this appeal submitted by the applicant is the previously dedicated and accepted irrevocable offer to dedicate right away, um, as well as the requirement to dedicate additional portions of land along Santa Monica Boulevard for future widening. The dedication was conducted by a prior landowner for a project that was never completed, and the applicant is seeking a street vacation to return property lines to pre-dedication standings. This would allow for uniform property line across multiple lots, which would then allow for the project without which the project would be infeasible. Ensuring that the project moves forward um, ensures that land uses specifically outlined in the general plan for this area are established to ensure a long-term sustainability of Hollywood's production industry. Additionally, the existing dedications are not necessary to meet the city's mobility needs as surrounding, as surrounding properties are built out and are unlikely to be dedicated in the foreseeable future. During the CPC meeting on August 10th, uh, the CPC concurred with the importance of this project for the region's economic growth and also pined that the goals of the 2035 mobility plan would be best served without the existing dedication, which would trigger a roadway widening. However, the commission stated that only a decision-making body, the city council, would have the authority to retract that previous dedication and deferred to this body. Our office supports the request put forward by the applicant in item number 14, council file number 231329S1, to be granted relief from the dedication via a new street vacation, as well as to grant the requested waiver of dedications for the remaining portions of the project site. In support of this request, our, our letter proposes revisions to specific conditions one, two, and five outlined by the Bureau of Engineering in the letter of determination submitted by the CPC on October 31st, 2023. Given the proposed revisions on behalf of Council District 13 and Council Member Soto Martinez, we respectfully ask for two actions from the Planning and Land Use Committee. The first is for agenda item number 13, Council File 231329, to move to approve the staff's recommendations. The second is for agenda item number 14, Council File 231329S1, to move to grant in part and deny in part the appeal of the Deputy Advisory Agency's approval of vesting tentative tract 834781A with the following modifications. To waive the required highway dedication and roadway widening for lot one of tract 9834 of 5601 to 5609 West Santa Monica Boulevard as submitted by our office and in front of you today. Um, I also wanted to take a quick moment to thank um, the staff that supported this effort, Moore Song, Heather Bleemers, um, and Kimberly Hongfu, um, who helped us move forward. Thank you for your time. All right, questions or comments from members of the committee? Vice Chair Lee. All right, uh, if planning supports the merger that the opponents asked for and CD13 
approves what the appellant is asking for. Why is the vacation process? Why not just do it through the merger to be faster and not a separate process? This is Heather Blamers. That is on the table, given that we do have a vesting tentative track map, so I would, rec would recommend that it be a merger and um, be included back into the site rather than the street vacation. Okay, so CD13, comfortable with that? That's totally fine. Okay, right. Mr. Lee, bringing people together. All right, so we have something, we have something new before us, uh, Mr. Mejia, based on this outbreak of democracy right here. <laughs> so on item 13, we will approve the, if that's the committee's will, approve the zoning and height district change ordinance, along with the modified conditions of approval, all included in the November 28th Planning Commission report, along with the environmental clearance. As to item number 14, it'll be a stated, um, a grant in part and denied in part as to the appeal of the deputy advisory agency's uh, vesting track map, along with the uh, letter submitted by Council District 13, and I believe the uh, caveat is on the issue of the merger. And uh, that is, uh, if that's what the committee wants, that's. We, we'd like to move such a, such, in such a fashion. Yes. As agreed to by both the. Yes, yeah, as agreed by the council office, by the planning department. Uh, yes, and the planning department and the applicant, everybody. Yes. And if that is the will, I can call the rules. So. All right. Uh, I will call the roll. Um, Mr. Harris Dawson? Yes. Mr. Lee? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Yes. Ms. Padilla? Aye. Ms. Hutt? Yes. Uh, five members and unanimous, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you so much. Everybody, that takes us to item number 15. Uh, yes, sir. Item 15, uh, it, it includes a statutory exemption and a categorical exemption from CEQA and related findings, a report from the zoning administrator and an appeal by Ms. Su Lung, um, who is um, appealing the denial of a reasonable accommodation request to a person with disability as it relates to allowing six foot high gates, hedges, and fences in the front yard in lieu of the requirements of the municipal, well, the municipal code in CD5. All right, we'll have a report from the Department of City Planning. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Courtney Shum, Associate Zoning Administrator with the Department of City Planning. Uh, I'm the initial decision maker on the reasonable accommodation case uh, before you on appeal for an individual reside, residing in the Wilshire Park uh, Historic Preservation Overlay Zone. Uh, here with me today is City Planner and Dean Petrillis, our lead planner on reasonable accommodation cases. And we also have our ADA coordinator, Carrie Stone, uh, from the Department on Disability to answer any questions you might have. Uh, before I get into the specifics of this case, I wanted to provide a brief overview of our reasonable accommodation process. Uh, this implements the Fair Housing Act and is a process where an individual can ask for zoning relief if it's tied to a medical disability and is necessary to eliminate barriers to housing. So you think of, for example, if someone uh, with dementia needs an over and height fence uh, because of their tendency to roam off, or if someone who uses a wheelchair needs to install an elevator in the side yard of their two-story home, uh, those are examples of reasonable accommodations that we've granted in the past. Uh, because this process can allow for deviations from the zoning code that would otherwise require a land use entitlement, associated processing fees, and a public process for stakeholder input, uh, we carefully scrutinize any requests that come in to make sure that they fall within the realm of reasonable accommodation. Uh, we do not reply on, or, or we do not rely on applicant testimony alone. Uh, if an applicant states that they are seeking accommodation to alleviate an underlying condition, uh, we consult with disability experts uh, like Ms. Stone, uh, and finally, um, <clears throat> we look for verification on medical necess necessity in the form of doctor's notes. Um, we also examine the individual circumstances of the site, the individual seeking accommodation, and their medical condition. Uh, this is to all to ensure that this process is appropriately applied uh, and most importantly, not abused. 
Uh, as mentioned, the applicant for the case before you today has requested accommodation to legalize an existing six foot high fence, hedge, and gate in their front yard of their single family dwelling on the basis that these improvements are necessary to address a medical condition for which they are seeking treatment. They allege that there were numerous incidents of crime on their property from December 2021 to December 2023 that exacerbated their condition and that since installing these barriers, the criminal activity has ceased. Uh, the request was denied on the basis that three of the four mandated findings to grant a reasonable accommodation could not be made, including uh, on finding one, that there had been no demonstration that the individual's medical condition rose to a level of disability. On finding two, that there has been no showing that the front yard barriers are necessary to provide a disabled individual access to housing. And lastly, on finding four, that granting accommodation to the applicant would circumvent the purpose of the zoning code and the city's regulations on, for reasonable accommodation, fencing, and historic preservation. Uh, it should be noted that upon filing their appeal, the applicant provided a supplemental letter from their medical practitioner uh, with further information relating to their disability status. Upon further consultation with the Department on Disability, um, this newly available information constitutes uh, verification of disability. It's therefore my recommendation that finding one, that the subject housing will be used by a disabled individual now be made in the affirmative. However, my position to deny this application still stands on the basis that findings two and four cannot be made. Uh, with regard to finding two, Based on evidence in the record, including the two letters from the applicant's medical practitioner, it's not apparent that the current configuration of the hedges, fences, and gate are necessary to eliminate barriers to housing caused by the applicant's disability. The applicant claims that an Im impenetrable barrier has been the only effective deterrent of crime despite other attempted security and monitoring measures. But it's not clear that the fence, gate, and hedge in its current location and opacity is the only means by which to prevent crime to alleviate the applicant's condition. Uh, to grant a reasonable accommodation, there must be a demonstration under finding four that the request would not require a fundamental alteration in the nature of the city's land use and zoning regulations. Uh, the city's zoning code includes restrictions on front yard fencing with the intent of maintaining open frontages for both safety uh, for eyes on the street and aesthetics for neighborhood compatibility. Similarly, the purpose of the HPOZ is to preserve the historic integrity and sense of place of the Wilshire Park neighborhood. The applicant contests finding four and references other properties in their neighborhood with fences and hedges in their front yard as reasons to approve the accommodation. However, a number of these examples have either shorter or more transparent fencing than the solid hedge and fence combination requested and the vast majority of these existed before the enactment of the Wilshire Park HPOZ and therefore maintain non-conforming status. In fact, the applicant's property had a similar non-conforming fence, but removed it and planted the hedge and new fence after the HPOZ was in place. Uh, these examples also represent only a small sample of properties in the historic district and are no representation of the overall character of the neighborhood. And in fact, multiple public comments have been submitted to the council file opposing the requested fence because of its incompatibility with the neighborhood. Uh, while the applicant has attested to their need for security to address their medical condition, this is not grounds to approve, approve what's already been installed. The applicant has not explored other options that are more aligned with the purpose and intent of the zoning code, including more transparent or setback fencing. And in that respect, the accommodation is not reasonable. That neighboring properties are improved with hedges and fences while this request has been denied is also not discriminatory to the applicant. The fact is that, that the Department of Building and Safety notified the applicant of their non-compliant barriers and gave them the opportunity to correct the violation. If any other surrounding properties are found in violation of the zoning code, they may similarly be required to seek relief. I can, however, confirm that none of these cited properties have sought permission for their fencing through an application to the Department of City Planning for relief of any kind from this requirement. So, so the applicant herein is not being denied a privilege that has been afforded to others in the neighborhood based on similar circumstances. Uh, I'd like to conclude by sharing uh, that the Fair Housing Act makes it unlawful to utilize land use policies that treat persons with disabilities less fav favorably than non-disabled persons. The applicant is not being treated less favorably due to disability. Her desire for security is a basic response that anyone with or without disability would have when there is heightened crime. 
In that respect, the applicant is not requesting something that would allow her to enjoy equal access to her housing. She's requesting something that would make her home more desirable than any other home in the area. For these reasons, I recommend that the appeal by the applicant be denied and that the planning department's original determination, with exception to the proposed modifications to finding one, be sustained. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. All right. Uh, we'll now ask the applicant and appellant to speak for three minutes. Good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Sue Leon. I am the applicant and the homeowner of the private residence at issue. Um, based on the Department of City Planning's um, admission that I do have a disability, I will address findings number two and four. Um, the for finding number two, the Department of City Planning uses the wrong legal standard. Um, they claim that the requested accommodation has to be necessary to alleviate the disability. However, U.S. v. City of Chicago Heights states that all that is necessary is to demonstrate, quote, the desired accommodation will affirmatively enhance a disabled plaintiff's quality of life by ameliorating the effects of the disability, end quote. The Department of City Planning is confusing a cure to my disability with treatment. My physician has identified that this gate is a form of treatment for my disability. My physician's note has further clearly stated that the gate ameliorates the effects of my disability. I have lived in my home for 12 years with my family and my two small kids without this gate. However, it was only after my diagnosis and discussions with my physician and her expert medical opinion have I requested this accommodation. This is not a permanent accommodation. Once and if I am better, I will remove it. If I sell my home, I will remove it as the accommodation follows me and not the residents. I will now address finding number four. Um, the Department of City Planning's finding number four is inaccurate. The request for accommodation um, will not disrupt the consistency of the aesthetics of the street. Uh, there are eight homes on our block alone that have over the height gates and hedges which do not disturb the aesthetics of the street. Our neighbor to the right, left, front, and both diagonals have over the height edges. And my direct neighbor's gate is actually uh, higher than ours. Allowing these homes to have over the height hedges and gates and not granting my request for an accommodation is in fact discriminatory. Pursuant to the Wilshire Park Preservation Guidelines, there's nothing in the guidelines that prohibits over height fences and gates. To the extent that an over height fence or gate is over 42 inches, the City Department of Planning can make variances according to page 64. How in matters of public safety, a simple semi-transparent wrought iron fence painted in dark green, dark brown, or black may be appropriate. Note, fences and hedges over 42 inches in the front yard require a variance from the planning department, and that's within the with preservation plan. And for these reasons, I respectfully request that the city council grant my request for a medical accommodation. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we'll begin our discussion by hearing from Council Mary Yaroslavsky. Thank you, I'll be brief. <clears throat> I just want to say that I very much sympathize with the applicant of this reasonable accommodation appeal. Uh, I've been advised, though, that granting this appeal could very well set a precedent for the entire city where we'd see a lot of these coming forward. Um, if we as a city want to hold a series of hearings where we talk about whether public safety supports changes to rules around fences, hedges and gates, and HPOZs, then we should do that and I'd welcome that. Uh, but to set that precedent today isn't something that I'm interested in doing or willing to do. So I'm asking that we deny this appeal, um, but that I do ask that we look into whether or not we wanna open this up on a broader scale. And I'm looking at um, General Manager Bertoni. Uh, because I, I think that this is something that comes up. I've heard from it. I live in an HPOZ and I have neighbors who are interested in doing similar things. And I think that we should look into that as whether or not we wanna go down that path. But I don't think doing that here and setting that precedent today is a, a good thing. Thank you, Council Member Padilla. So I do have a question. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, because I wanna make sure that I don't fall on the side of prioritizing historical preservation over someone's health. So are what you're telling me that 
given this applicant's medical request for this fence, which you cannot share with us because of, I don't know, HIPAA um, rules, you have made a judgment call that this health condition doesn't uh, dignify the fence, similar to how dementia, you, once, you mentioned once upon a time approving it because of dementia with fencing and elevators for wheelchair access. Are you telling us that you did that? Again, I'd like to clarify, um, and Ms. Stone, who's, who's more versed on um, issues of disability, can, can help fill me in, but um, it goes back to the question of whether this request is reasonable. Um, we've received the applicant's doctor's note indicating the need for fencing, uh, but, but again, this goes back to the question of whether the, requ the request is reasonable. And the fact is that we need to make fi a finding under finding four, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, that this doesn't circumvent the purpose of the zoning code. And so when we're looking at these requests, we still need to make sure that they're reasonable and in line with our other regulations. Well, then I guess my fear is, it sounds like you've made in the past the argument that dementia does designate um, adjustments for fencing. I'm just afraid that I'm gonna be leaving this meeting wondering, is it anxiety, is it depression? It, like, well, what is it that was brought to your attention that you deemed not worthy of this reasonable uh, denial? I'd like to speak to that. Is it this one? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. It's, we have, or they have not made a determination that this individual's disability doesn't merit um, equal concern to anybody else's disability. Um, the example regarding dementia, let me back up a tiny bit, just for like a full scope picture of what the fair housing laws, both state and federal, um, how they've been used historically, and I do believe this is how they were intended to be used in terms of um, changing, you know, giving waivers from zoning requirements. The bulk of them have to do with group homes and definition of family. How are you, are you gonna allow a group home or a nursing home in this area or do we have to, is this zoning preventing people with disabilities from living in this area? That's the, really the bulk of the cases. Um, to a lesser extent, there are situations where someone will say, you know, I've got a family member with a dementia or a child with autism who flees and the fence is necessary or we cannot live here because the person will run away. The basic point of the law is to put the individual with a disability in an equal, kind of an equal um, ability to enjoy their housing. With regard to this scenario with constant break-ins being the cause of the situation, um, it seems that to put in, to allow, not to put in, but to allow to remain this big fence or, or you know, barrier would put the individual not in an equal setting, but really in a better setting if in fact everyone is getting broken into on such a regular basis. And what um, Ms. Yaroslavsky, or Councilwoman Yaroslavsky's uh, point being, this, this seems like a very legitimate problem uh, but one best approach, not through using the reasonable accommodation ordinance or the reasonable accommodation breakout in the law, but through a means that will help the entire neighborhood. So you're saying that this is a stretch? This is a stretch from what I've seen. I mean, for example, there was a case where the applicant had MS. This isn't here, this is published. The applicant had MS and requested to be able to put a carport in what was the setback. and the judge held, well, yes, it, it, it would make life a lot, a lot better. But that was held not to be fully necessary. That was something that would have assisted that individual. There was another case where somebody put up a fence because the person had PTSD. And it was, I believe they said, yes, this would make life better. But if, if and I don't know that in that case the issue was um, that the whole neighborhood was 
you know, prone to break-ins, but it was found that it, it didn't rise to the level of necessity. So, so there's the need where nobody has said the person doesn't have a disability or like legitimate disability that's not on the table. The issue is, is, some, is a fence of that magnitude actually necessary? So the doctor's note said, you know, the person said that this would be helpful, not that there wasn't something that would be less violating of the, so I'm not an expert on what the HPOZ says, you know, it has to be, but, but really it's kind of that fine of an argument, and it, this is, again, the, the, so the point I, is Let me rephrase, let me yeah. re ask a new question to maybe get to where I want to get. Are you trying to tell us today that this is an applicant who really wants their fence, however, given the historical overlay, it's not appropriate to build this fence, and what is happening here is that they're utilizing the disability excuse to make a stretch for the sake of what they would like to happen? I, I wouldn't go that far to say they're using it as an excuse. And that's sort of what we fear in terms of the presidents? Yeah, okay then, okay. Yeah, I, 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 could, I would say that, yeah. I guess I'm a little conflicted because the last thing that I wanna do is, um, because I don't know what the disability is, being able to make that judgment call. I, I feel it's like we have, mm -hmm. it sounds like you, we can deny the gate, take it to court, and then city attorney is gonna be, you know, mitigating between the recommendation of a doctor and whatever that disability might be. And they're gonna litigate on the federal level, right? On federal um, presidents of whether it applies or not. But I guess I just need more information because I don't, again, I don't feel comfortable saying that a doctor's no doesn't a delegate prioritizing, um, uh, you know, the protection of historical overlay. Yeah, I'm, I'm Dean Petrulis from planning. I just wanted to add, we did, um, we did give the council offices um, unredacted versions of the medical records, so you do have those, or you did receive those. But just to, um, to your point, so the doctor's note was not specific and did not say that a six foot high fence versus a five and a half foot fence would help with the disability. It was very generic saying, we'd like you to help with this disability. Um, it didn't say how the fence exactly would help and why this kind of fence in particular, whereas there are fences in HPOZ areas and there are non-conforming fences that were there prior to the HPOZ being established. So there is a history of fences. We're just trying to say why this kind of fence? Why not an opaque fence maybe, like, like in the neighborhood? Like everybody has a lower, you know, fence, they look similar, um, and like, like Mishum said, they, this house did have a fence before they took it down and put up a higher fence and higher hedges that are opaque and you can't see through. And, and with, with, our, um, with the plans, with the HPOZ plans, um, LAPD always has input and says that they wanna see into your yard because they don't know what goes on behind these high fences that are opaque as well. So are we creating, are we then creating a problem by allowing this fence, this type of fence, let's say, that way? Anything else, Ms. Padilla? I was just gonna say, you know, I, I did get a document that kind of shows the fencing in neighboring homes, and it looks like the average is indeed six feet. I, I'm seeing five feet, five feet, three feet, seven feet. Um, and I think about my district and how many fences have, been, have gone up without any sort of process, and I can't look into them. So again, I'm a little conflicted because I, I don't wanna go against anyone related to the um, Disability Rights Committee community. Thank no you, Councilmember Hutt. I, I'm curious about 
how we know that the doctor knows that a higher fence is going to help the disability if it's common practice that we don't have these high fences? Do, did anyone ask that question? Like if it's, if it's not practical that we have high fences that you can't see through, how do we know that this will be helpful? Well, <clears throat> I think we rely upon, and, and again, if it would be helpful, council members, we do have a copy of the doctor's notes that we can, you all are privy to this information because you're the decision makers, but um, because we're in a public setting, we can't publicly discuss sure. these issues. So if it would be helpful, we can share that um, privately. But um, Because did, did they show some reporting like these people with this disability have this kind of fence in it? Uh, it's operational and helpful? It, it, do, it doesn't go into that level of specificity. It depends on um, the doctor's notes. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just getting over my, my voice. But um, <clears throat> in this case, uh, the, the doctor's note explains that based on testimony from her patient, she feels that offense of this height is necessary. So it's really a, a reiteration of uh, what the um, applicant feels that she needs. So is it height or is it see-through? Uh, the opacity of the fence wasn't discussed in the medical note, but it did mention the six feet in height. Thank you. All right, any other comments on this item? All right. Ms. Yaroslavsky, close. Make a recommendation. Uh, I think we need to deny the appeal. Thank you. All right, that's been moved. Mr. Mejia, if you can call the roll. Uh, yes, uh, deny the appeal, Councilman, and then as stated on the record by the city planner, the only modification is to finding number one from her original report. Uh, I will call the roll. Mr. Harris Dawson? Yes. Mr. Lee? Absent. Ms. Jaroslawski? Yes. Ms. Padilla? Ms. Hutt? Yes. That is four ayes, one member absent, and that carries. All right, uh, that takes us to our next item. Item number 16, sir. This is a planning commission report that it contains six appeals relative to the approval of a conditional use permit to allow a density increase for the construction of a new residential project with 43 dwelling units, 11 units reserved for very low income households in CD5. All right, we'll begin by hearing from Department of City Planning. Good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Sophia Kim, planning staff with LA City Planning. The case before you, item 16 for council file 231086 is an appeal of a project that involves the demolition of two existing duplexes, total of four dwelling units for the construction, use and maintenance of a new five-story, 62-foot residential project with 43 dwelling units and 11 of the total units reserved for very low-income households within the Palms Mar Vista del Rey Community Plan Area, located at 3676-3704 South Kelton Avenue and 10845 West Regent Street. This project was fully approved by the City Planning Commission on July 27, 2023. On September 18, 2023, six appellants who are all members of the neighborhood appealed the City Planning Commission's approval of the project's conditional use permit, entitlement, and unmanned density bonus incentives, as well as its categorical exemption, Clustery 2, and CEQA clearance. The decision of the Los Angeles City Planning Commission related to the off menu density bonus incentive and waivers of development standards is not appealable. The on-menu density bonus incentives are appealable to city council by the applicant or abutting owners and occupants per LAMC section 1222A25G2. The appellant's appeal points include sewage um, backup issues and flooding in the block of Kelton Avenue, pedestrian safety to walk in the narrow street, and the large size of the proposed building exacerbating the already existing safety and health issues in the neighborhood. The existing, the existing sewage system's malfunctions and the, and the existing storm drain system are not an impact of the proposed project. 
the project's um, traffic impacts were determined to be less than significant based on modeling performed by the LA Department of Transportation. Contrary to the appellant's allegation, the City Planning Commission's decision to approve the deviations in height, floor area ratio, and site yards are not subjective and are consistent with the city and state density bonus requirements. And pursuant to LAMC section 1222-825, the applicant is permitted to request on and off menu incentives and waivers of development standards for a deviation in high floor area ratio and site yard requirements if a percentage of the dwelling units proposed by the project is set aside for affordable housing and if the decision maker finds that the incentives and waivers are necessary to provide for the affordable housing cost and will not have an adverse impact on public health, safety, and, and the physical environment. The project will set aside 11 dwelling units, or 78% of the base dwelling units permitted in the RD2-1 and R3-1 zone for very low income households consistent with the state density bonus law. And at its meeting on July 27, 2023, the CPC found that the incentives and waivers are necessary to provide for the affordable housing cost and will not have an adverse impact on public health, safety, and the physical environment. In addition, um, planning submitted a response to the appeal in a letter to the council file dated January 10, 2024, as stated in the letter to the Plum Committee. The proposed project meets all zoning criteria for the requested conditional use and density bonus entitlements. The project has been adequately assessed under CEQA with substantial evidence submitted into the record and through the project's Cluster 2 categorical exemption case number EMB 2023583CE. Therefore, in conclusion, planning recommends that the Planning and Land Use Management Committee deny the appeal and sustain the City Planning Commission's decision. Um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, we have a number of appellants on this. I think I count six. Um, so each of you, uh, in any order, will be able to speak for two minutes. Or you can all decline. There's six of you, so we're going to give two minutes to each of you. And so someone should come and start now. Instead of arguing with me from the back of the room. Hi, my name is Manzar Furuhar, and I live right across the street from the proposed project. Um, now, this project had many, many issues that my uh, neighbors are going to talk about. Because of the limit of the time, I'm going to focus on the process, which I believe it was rigged uh, with irregularities and legal misconduct. Uh, the first thing is that when we find out about the project, 200, uh, 300 uh, members of the community signed a petition uh, opposing the project because of the health and uh, safety issues that this project will uh, create for our community. They also went to all different meetings, but the CPC uh, Commission ignored all of that and what they did, they approved the project, and they also ignored the legal misconduct that happened during this project. For example, on uh, June 14th, the uh, members of the Palms Plum Committee went to a social setting with the representative of the developer, and they discussed this project. This break of, uh, breach of uh, Brown Act was reported to CPC, but the uh, representative ignored it and included uh, that report of support by the same committee, Plum Committee of Palms, into their findings. Now, uh, the problem is that here we have uh, developers versus the community. So please, we implore you to investigate this process 
and stand with the community. Please do not make this case. Another example of uh, decision-making uh, problems and the lack of transparency and a lack of integrity in the decision-making process in Los Angeles. Thank, Thank you. you. Next appellant. You had promised me four minutes. You're going to have two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, as Tell me your name. Tell me, me your name. Reed Hutchinson. Okay, thank you. Yes, okay, okay. proceed. As a 35-year uh, resident of Kelton Avenue, I'm here representing my wife and myself, but also as the neighborhood council representative for Palms Area A, I am here for the 300 plus residents and voters who have voiced their concerns in opposition to this project as it now stands. This large scale development in our already densely populated community will adversely affect the health, well-being and environment of our community and its residents. Parking challenges are already a concern in the neighborhood. Inadequate parking options will only worsen the situation with the construction, exacerbating the quest for parking spaces, especially on the street sweeping and trash pickup days. Adding a significant number of new residents will lead to increased traffic congestion and frustration for both the new and existing residents of Palms. Uh, inadequate sewage and storm drain capacity are already pressing issues in the neighborhood. This development, 201% larger than current zoning regulations allow, will inevitably lead to increased wastewater and stormwater runoff. Our existing utility infrastructure is not prepared to handle the increased demand for additional households. Without in inadequate infrastructure upgrades to handle this surge, we will experience more infrequent flooding and contamination of water sources and pollutants. The allure of our neighborhood lies not only in the size and scale of the homes and apartments with its green spaces and old growth trees. This new construction will be sacrificing these green spaces and upending the scale of our neighborhood, both of which are essential for the well-being of our residents. We realize that growth is essential for the vitality of the city, but it must be managed thoughtfully to prevent adverse effects to the existing communities. A detailed and impartial impact uh, environmental impact assessment considering the existing sewage and storm drain capacity issues should be undertaken. Invest in upgrading the infrastructure before new developments begin, not with quick fix temporary solutions when problems arise in their wake. Please involve the residents of the community and the representatives throughout the planning process. Seek out our feedback, something that has been sorely lacking up to this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Bell. My name is Albert Kim. My partner and I live across this proposed site for over eight years, and we are appealing the discretionary waivers, which will severely impact our neighborhood's public health and safety. As mentioned in my written appeal, our block has had decades of sewer and stormwater drainage issues that still plague us even today. Since my appeal was submitted, heavy rains over the last three months have yet again caused deep rivers of overflowing stormwater on our streets, mixing with sewage that is backed up into our streets and into our homes. Sewage from the proposed 43 units and the numerous housing developments that were previously already approved will undoubtedly add to this existing public health and safety issue. Additionally, killing 26 mature trees on the property and replacing them only with nine new growth trees will absorb ex exponentially less rainwater as supported by the US EPA. This is catastrophically uh, going to impact our already overwhelmed storm drainage issues. If you ask people supporting the project where they live, they don't mention where they live because they don't live anywhere near the proposed intersection. They don't have to deal with the frequent sewer backups, sewage smells on our streets, and monthly sewage maintenance that is necessitated by these backups. They don't understand that the intersection of Kelton and Regent is topographically lower in elevation, forcing the sewage and stormwater of the entire Palms neighborhood onto our small street. We ask that you hear the voices of my family and the 300 plus neighbors who have signed a petition opposing the development. Developers don't have carte blanche to these mega density bonuses, incentives, and a sequin exemption. The recent snowball case proves that the city can act in support of its constituents. Additionally, the developer's representative has another recently approved 70 unit property on Kelton, three parcels away, that had a sequin exemption. Granting this proposed pr property another CEQA exemption appears to be against state regulations due to the cumulative impacts on health, safety, and environment. We urge 
for a proper CEQA environmental study to be completed before you approve these unprecedented bonuses and incentives. Thank you. All right, I have, I'm speaking on behalf of, we put this through the clerk, of uh, Caitlin and Kelly uh, and David. So if I can, and I'm reading, and I apologize, you see me usually in a suit, I got drenched, and so no disrespect meant uh, here, but um, do you want that to go piece by piece? You wanna put it all in six minutes? How do you wanna go? So I know well, whether we keep going. Well, uh, we don't normally transfer minutes. <laughs> sure, I was, clerk gave us the approval to have me represent these individuals. If, if you, the speaker could, is speaking as a proxy, yes. we can have the time that was given to those to speak on yep. their behalf, but there's no seating of minutes to, to increase a single person's time. Okay, so right. you're Correct. speaking for yourself and as a proxy for two other people? For three, Caitlin, Kelly, and David. All right, and so, so go ahead and give your presentation. Okay, thanks Thank guys. Um, this is for Kelly. And my name is Lee Wallach, uh, for the record, representing Kelly Lally. I live across the street from the proposed de development and appealing the discretionary waivers of the development standards, which if, if approved would lead to a shocking 201 density increase while adding only five net new affordable units. The project should not be given secret exemption since this class of exemptions is not intended for projects that will result in any significant no traffic, noise, air quality, water quality impacts. None of the following can apply. The project can, can and successive projects of the same type in the same place will result in a cumulative impact. This is clear. There are unusual circumstances creating the reasonable possibility of significant effects. This project, along with the similar de uh, development on the same street by the same representatives, just three parcels away at 3730 Kelton, introduces significant concerns. Both projects propose five-story tall multifamily buildings adding approximately 150 new residents to the block without conducting environmental traffic and noise studies to assess the impact on public health, safety, and environment. Any reasonable person can see this will exacerbate the existing safety and infrastructure issues outlined by my neighbors. An additional burden will be placed on the sensory impaired HUD disabled housing adults located next door. I additionally asked Plum not to approve these entitlements that have factual errors and incompleteness in the letter of determination. Section 8.3, the affordable housing unit count is incorrect and confusing to the public. The uppermost story is set back from the northern building facade line and additional blank space, a blank feet. feet. We acknowledge the developer's right to take advantage of California density bonus. We want cars, they'll talk about bikes, all of that is fine. We just need this a little smaller. They are not automatically entitled to an, uh, extra waivers of the development standards. Supported by Snowball Investments during the, versus the City of LA, where the court cited, and this council, including the chair, sided with the city in denying the developer additional units being requested. Snowball's request for a zoning change to allow higher density on their property consistent with the general plan but exceeding the zoning limit of 19 single family homes was denied by the city due to concerns of public safety, further studies. The court ruled that HAA did not apply as the project did not align with the exi existing zoning and no findings were required for disapproval. Um, Caitlin, my name is Caitlin K McKeeler. I live at 3713 Kelton Avenue. I grew up in a house in the area and have chosen to remain there as a renter. My parents bought their property in 1986. When they wanted to develop a fourplex, they were denied because it was out of size and scope. We're in the same situation now. Over 300 people signed a petition detailing our safety environmental concerns. Numerous people have been hit, cars destroyed, including mine. The smell of sewage that has pervaded the air for 20 years, additionally another five story project has been approved on the same side of the street less than a block away. According to my research, this does not allow the developers to bypass studies and build regulation and building regulations to build another building of this man magnitude on this street. Allowing this project to go forward opens up the city to plethora of requests by developers to build whatever they choose without the proper studies wherever they choose. Um, in addition, this project displaces six people who must find other housing Okay. So how does five low rent units out of 43 even qualify for an over 200% increase? 
uh, of what is allowable to be built by this developer. There are no sidewalks, there's no space to add them. At 30 feet wide, Kelton Avenue is so narrow, only a, one car can pass at a time. Palms Middle School, Charnock School, the kids walk down this street. They're cutting down 26 mature planting and planting little seedlings. 26 mature trees will be cut down. On a personal note, there's two DWP main breaks in front of this home. The first in August that has created a river pouring down our driveway. The fire department came out and built a dam out of dirt to keep the water out of my house. Approximately four months later, water again started pouring into our home. Now I go to David. The projects need to stay within the state zoning parameters. These projects are asking for additional, too much additional from the city. In my many years, I've never seen a 205 uh, over what is, what is usually granted. And granting this setting is a precedent, so all your districts are next. They should not be granted. Sewer, storm drains, and infrastructure cannot handle it. Garages have been flooded, dozens of cars. I think poop coming up, poop coming up in our home on a regular basis is a CEQA issue. Um, your con constituents wait 30 to 40 minutes to get a 911 call. You will be told that the city has no discretion. That is not true. You've already won the case. You can stand up for your residents. They're not entitled to whatever zone change they wish. The court was clear on that. Between the two projects on the same block, regulation is clear, the snowball case, and the errors in the letter of determination, we ask you to, su not to support the appeals you can support housing, we support housing, just smaller housing. They can go one floor less. This is possible. We can't continue to give away the store and put housing in front of infrastructure. We're putting the cart before the horse. We can do better in this city. We hope that you will support the 300 people who have signed petitions, the people who have to deal with sewage every week and ask uh, uh, support our appeals, they'll have to come back with a smaller building and we'll support that when it happens. Thank you very much. All right, I think that concludes our uh, appellants. Now we'll have uh, the applicant, and now you'll appreciate that reduction in a mi of one minute each. We'll have our appellant for one, two, three, four, five, ten minutes, six, twelve minutes. Wow, okay. Um, 12 minutes, okay, well, Jesse Harris, I'm from Brian Silvera and Associates, uh, we're the applicant's representative. Par pardon me, Mr. Spindler, sit down, thank you. Um, so I'd like to start first, actually, by thanking everyone who came out here um, and gave their thoughtful testimony and, and dialogue. Um, we've spent a lot of time in this uh, community outreach process and um, their, your input really has changed the project for the better, so thank you. Um, the proposed project site is in a neighborhood zoned for multifamily development in a high resource area, as characterized by the city's 2021 fair share housing report. That report, which was, uh, w which was prepared by the LA Housing Department and the LA Department of City Planning in partnership, uh, that report recommends reducing barriers to prioritize affordable housing developments in higher resource areas like the one in which the project is located to address patterns of racial and economic segregation, promote jobs and housing balance, provide ample housing opportunities, and affirmatively further fair housing. Uh, according to that report, 76% of the residential parcels in higher resource areas are limited to single family uses. So, it's critical that we make good use of the parcels available to us in order to meet our stated goals for inclusive, equitable communities. This is one of the very few um, parcels zoned for multifamily development in high resource areas. Um, so that is consistent with the stated goals of the city. In fact, uh, the proposed 43 unit apartment building includes 11 units set aside for very low income households. So um, when you exclude 100% affordable developments, uh, this 26% affordability is the highest rate of affordability ever proposed in a privately funded mixed income development in this community plan area. Um, and it's the conditional use permit for this project uh, for additional density that really sets it apart. Without the conditional use permit, um, if we were just doing a regular density bonus project, we'd be limited to 19 units with just two of them affordable. Right off bat, we have four existing units, and based on the LA Housing Department's analysis, three of those uh, 
are deemed affordable. And so that right there kicks us out of a regular density bonus and into a conditional use density bonus, uh, which is what we are um, presenting here. Um, I'm also proud to report that we have made changes to the proposed project in direct response to concerns from the community. So we increased the parking supply. Um, originally, we came, uh, the, pro the original project that we proposed at 24 parking spaces, we increased it to 33 parking spaces, and that was at a loss to the project. The, the project lost 4,000 square feet of um, net rentable area, and that's, a, that's significant, but we thought that that was important to do because we heard the concerns of the neighbors. I also want to highlight that we are in an AB 2097 area, so state law prohibits the enforcement of any parking minimum requirement. So all of the parking spaces that have been proposed as part of this development have been volunteered by the applicant out of respect for the surrounding neighbors. Um, and because we understand the importance of green space and landscaping to this community, we've also revised the landscape plan, which was submitted to the clerk on uh, January 11th. Uh, we, we revised the landscape plan to include 38 drought tolerant trees. That includes um, five trees in the parkway where two currently exist and uh, 28 trees on site where 19 currently exist. Um, so that's almost double uh, what currently exists on, on site in terms of trees. Uh, in addition, we incorporated three ADA accessible units on the ground floor, uh, and we'll be making a five-foot dedication to the public right-of-way along the property frontage per the uh, BOE recommendation. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to emphasize the neighborhood level improvements that this developer has committed to, which includes adding a three-way stop sign to the intersection of Regent and Kelton, um, and this request is already in motion with the LA Department of Transportation. Uh, in studying the installation of speed bumps along Kelton Avenue and contributing towards sidewalk installation and improvements along Regent Street, which of course um, is separated from the project by a few hundred uh, feet. Again, this is something that we heard from the community and something that the applicant understood was Im important to, uh, to community members, and so he agreed to make those um, installations and improvements. In November, Mayor Karen Bass signed Executive Directive 7 to encourage mixed income apartment projects with at least 20% of their units set aside uh, as covenanted affordable units. Uh, so projects just like this one. Um, and that's because this development and others like it are the solution to our homelessness problem and our desperately worsening housing crisis. We know from our regional housing needs assessment that we need very low income units and we also need market rate units. Um, the sort of the gold standard of addressing all of our greenhouse gas impacts caused by vehicle miles traveled, um, as well as our, uh, our lack of housing, is mixed income development, um, and especially developments that are providing um, a significant number of affordable units. Um, we're working diligently with the council office to devise a condition that will help make sure that local folks have access to these affordable units. So. Um, <coughs> I ask that you approve this mixed income apartment building and contribute to the well-being of, of a healthy, vibrant community that fosters inclusivity and economic resilience for individuals and families. And then since I have a little more time than I thought I would, um, I did want to speak. You're not at all required to use it. You're right. You're right about that. I'll be quick. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the sewer and stormwater impact. So um, the project is integrating what's called low impact uh, development planters and so uh, low impact development planters actually help to absorb storm water. Um, they can remove nutrients and bacteria and metals from storm water while reducing the volume and intensity of storm water flows. So in total this project integrates 723 square feet of low impact development that's LID landscape materials um, via a dry well and it has the capacity of 437 cubic feet of water. So this project um, ostensibly will actually improve the stormwater conditions on the street. I also want to speak a little bit to the sewage impacts, which are pre-existing, so not a project impact. But like all projects, this one will be required to pay a fee, um, a sewer facilities charge, uh, that will be determined by uh, BOE and the Department of Public Works to make sure that the infrastructure uh, surrounding the project site can support the project. So again, um, there will likely be a net gain in the functioning of that infrastructure. Um, 
Uh, someone mentioned that there's another development down the street that we represented that was 70 units. That one was 27 units, actually. Um, just like this one, uh, it's more than one parcel. That one's two, two lots next to each other. This one's three lots next to each other. So they're each about 14 units per lot, um, which is consistent with the sort of density that we need in an urbanized area that has access to quality transit. There's about 15 bus stops within 500 feet of this project site. Um, and it's about a mile from the Palms Expo Line station. So it's really an ideal location for, um, for density and mixing housing units and, and job opportunities. So I'll stop there and um, allow council to deliberate. And uh, of course, I'm available for any questions that you might have for the project team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Yaroslavsky. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to thank my constituents who've come out uh, on this rainy day um, to, can you stop giving the middle finger? It's incredibly distracting. Uh, Madam City Attorney, for the record, during the entire set of presentations, Mr. Spindler's been making obscene gestures at the speakers and at the committee members. So I just, I'm grateful for that. And um, I'm also grateful to the applicant for making modifications and making this an iterative process. I think that, that the, the proposal is, is better for it. Um, so first I wanna add a, a condition that I hope we can consider. And then I have some questions for both the city attorney's office and, and the planning staff. Um, the, the condition reads, the property owner shall reach out to CD5 based community groups to promote the availability of units on the property to qualifying individuals and families and that's intended for the set aside affordable units. Um, so just a few questions. So it's my understanding that this is a state density bonus project and that we don't have discretion to mandate that it be made smaller or shorter or anything of that sort. I just, that's my working understanding, correct? the mic on thank you this is Heather Blamers that is correct okay so um, can the city attorney come up or do you want to do it from there that's fine um, so can you talk a little bit about the snowball case and and how if at all it applies here sure Adrian Corisani city attorney's office um, so snowball looked at a different issue um, it dealt with the city's interpretation of its general plan specifically um, looking at the application or harmonizing of a footnote in a community plan. Um, it didn't address the specifics of the density bonus regulations. Um, it really was about the city's own long-standing policy on zoning consistency. Because of some of the exemptions that are provided under the HAA, it was important for us to be able to maintain the policy that, that was at issue there with zoning consistency. So it wasn't really about the findings that are at play today whether you know we can make those two very meet those high thresholds to deny density bonus right very specific you know qualitative adverse effects on health and safety those thresholds are, are the ones that are really at issue here and it's the determination of the city attorney's office and the planning department that that, that evidence doesn't exist that would allow us to deny to grant the appeal Heather Blamers with City Planning. That is correct. There's no evidence in the record that would ever give us the ability to deny these density bonuses. So I, I also understand that the state's Housing Accountability Act includes a provision that if the applicant challenges the city's denial of the project, so if we were to vote to grant the appeal today, um, we would be required to award not only attorney's fees and costs of the suit, but also a per unit fee of up to $50,000 per unit, which would equal $2.1 million for this project. Is that correct? I know we get letters from the state uh, sometimes when we deny projects, basically saying you're gonna be liable. Sophia Kim with city planning. Yes, that calculation is correct. Were any technical studies submitted by the appellants to contest the city's prior project approvals? Um, Sophia came with city planning. No technical studies have been submitted by the appellants um, to contest the city's prior project approvals. So, thank you. Um, so, based on this conversation, I just want to be clear. Is there any substantial evidence in the record to grant this appeal? Um, Sophia came with city planning. No substantial evidence was submitted by any appellants. So, okay, thank you. I, so, I just want to say to my constituents, I get it. 
There's a lot of density going into places in our city that are already very dense. I live in a multifamily neighborhood and that's where a lot of the density is going based on changes in state law. And I've encouraged um, this community to go talk to their state representatives about how state law changes are affecting our communities because we don't have that discretion anymore. And I hear from people who are very frustrated by that and I share that frustration. So um, there's not much we can do here today, which is to say I don't think there's anything we can do here today. Um, I think that the applicant has worked very hard with the community to try and get it to a place where it's um, less impactful than it was at the outset and I'm grateful for that. So the state has come in and decided that we don't have local land use authority over lots of things anymore and, and we just don't and that's frustrating for constituents who want the city to be standing up for communities in the way that they like and we just don't have that authority anymore. So um, colleagues, I'm asking that we deny the appeal because it doesn't seem like we can grant the appeal. I think this is a, a good project considering. It's, it's not what the, all the community wants, but I'm asking that we deny the appeal because I don't see that we have a choice. All right, thank you so much. Any other comments from members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, there's uh, been a motion. If we can read specific instructions into the record and call the roll. Uh, yes, to deny the, the six appeals um, and thereby sustain the determination of the Planning Commission relative to the approval of a conditional use permit to allow a density bonus increase for the construction of a new residential project with 43 dwelling units, 11 units reserved for very low income households at the project site uh, noted on the agenda. Uh, to clarify, the councilwoman of the district requested to add a new condition to reach out uh, to the neighbors. To work with community based community organizations on locating folks to fill the set aside affordable units. Okay, and that condition should be reflected in the committee report as stated by the Councilwoman of the District. I will call the roll. Um, Mr. Harris Dawson? Yes. Mr. Lee? Absent. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Yes. Ms. Padilla? Yes. Ms. Hutt? Yes. Four members and unanimous, uh, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Here, can you confirm that that concludes our business for today? It does, sir. It Excellent. We are adjourned. Thank you so much, everybody. <coughs>